Welcome to Some Dare Call It Conspiracy. I am Brent Lee. And I'm Neil Sanders. And I'm Greg Hall. Welcome to Movie Night. Why, why are we here today? Oh, dear. Uh, you made us watch a terrible film. <laughs> yeah. I don't know who we're blaming here, but someone me. sent in the group chat the mother load of Red Pill documentary. <laughs> yeah, that would be me. Didn't you watch it and it got you really angry? And so you were like, right, I've got to inflict this on the other two. Yeah. Like, yeah. I sent I sent a message to you and I was like, I've just watched this. This is, I am so angry. Plandemic 3, The Great Awakening. Oh, my God. Oh, I'm so annoyed and I had to let it off on you and I was like you know what I think we should do this as a movie night yeah like interestingly when I was when I was watching it I was about sort of five ten minutes into it and I was like there's a lot going on in this I wonder if we should do a deep dive of this because you know it, it does make a lot of claims but luckily it just continuously makes the same claims over and over again so after about 10 minutes it was like no you know we really don't know if we could probably do this on the back of a napkin <laughs> like so like oh dear i was slightly concerned that because it was number three that i was not going to understand the plot because uh <laughs> yeah, you know. there was no fear <laughs> at all because it had no real plot, to be honest. Well, it has it has secret plots and communist plots. There you, yeah, true, true. Like, but but no sort of narrative. Like, well, uh, it, it, mm, yeah, the twisting the narrative. Well, this is what was like slightly got me about it was because um, Chapier, what's his name, Mickey Willis, is is that the name that right the the director? He obviously did Plandemic One um, and Plandemic Two. Plandemic One is. Um, Judy Mikovits' story, isn't it? That basically, they, they, I think the long and short of it is COVID isn't actually um, that harmful and um, the vaccines are the ones that actually um, are, are dangerous. And basically, she says that all sort of diseases are, of is it XRMV or something? This mice virus that she became obsessed with because she she thought that it was the, um, the cause of... Um, Oh, what's the thing? What's it called? Uh, MECFS. Thank you. That's the thing. Uh, and um, and she was doing, you know, with with great intention. She was actually sort of trying to um, get to the bottom of uh, of of it, wasn't she? And uh, she'd been hired by this incredibly wealthy uh, couple who were impressed by her. Uh, which uh, she was working in a bar at the time. It's almost like a sort of um, a humor league song or something. Like um, <laughs> she she. Um, she was working at a bar and she met this really wealthy couple uh, and uh, essentially their their daughter was it it was was ill and they hired her to do all sorts of research to try and find out if she could you know get to the bottom hopefully um even sort of move towards a cure and she became convinced that the the cause of it was this mice virus called XRMV or XM XRMV I believe it is I may have got that wrong but the long and short of it is that for a time, everybody was like thrilled about this, and uh, unfortunately, what happened was when they tried to replicate her studies, they found that they just could not find the same results. And they went and looked back at her uh, paper, and it looks kind of like basically some of the experiment might have got contaminated because they they had mice in the laboratory, they were working on those the particular types of viruses and such like that in the mice, or they're prevalent in the mice. There was a there was a potential chain of evidence essentially that that was like ah we think we know what's happened here. However, if you can replicate the studies, you know we find out that basically that's not the case. Go for it. it she was never able to to um, show the same results, and there was a a bit of a falling out with people, and she ended up getting into a bit of bother because she uh, ended up going back and trying to get her research, which was on a laptop and a notebook. This was considered laboratory property at the time so she was briefly um uh, imprisoned and i don't think she was ever uh, like i don't think she she might have been briefly charged but i don't think she was actually convicted of anything was was she sort of all sort of went away but essentially her paper was retracted and she felt rather sort of smited by the industry um and by sort of previous sort of you know patrons and stuff like that um and 
she kind of set up this whole sort of thing where for some reason I, I forget the exact details it's some really spurious link like Fauci worked worked at the organization that rebutted her paper or something like that so when sort of covid came around she had this right being upon it against the industry and against Fauci and such like that and she decided to 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 basically tell people that that this was the cause of it, that XMRV, this mice virus, was the cause of COVID, and uh, she, the the first uh, pandemic is ridiculous. Does it, does it include all the stuff about like don't wear masks because you'll poison yourself with your own germs wearing masks and ludicrous crap like this? And anyway, Mickey Willis, the guy who's the director, he's also cross with Fauci because essentially he's older brother i believe died of an aids related illness and he blames it on the medication azt now azt was um have you ever seen that um uh, either the the stage play or the tv series um angels in america it's about roy Cohn. it's absolutely amazing it's brilliant everyone should watch it it's um who else is in it uh the guy who's in um um, all the, the Annabelle films, the bloke that plays the Warren fellow, he's um, uh, in it. Um, and um, uh, Al Pacino's in it. Uh, and he plays Roy Cohn. It's absolutely amazing. But the, 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 in that, they talk about how Roy Cohn managed to get a huge amount of this AZT, which was like really, really difficult to get hold of. Like it, it was... There's various schools of thought, one which is real and one which is conspiratorial. Like, it, it's not, I don't believe it's used anymore because I think they found that there were better um, uh, medicines uh, and such like that. And I think there were some, in some cases, some very, very bad side effects. But overwhelmingly, it's been shown that basically it helped extend people's lives and it wasn't, um, you know, it wasn't killing people because there is a conspiracy theory that basically the, the AZT was what was killing people. And that either HIV doesn't exist or it isn't actually that harmful or it doesn't lead to AIDS. There's various sort of flavours of this lunacy. Um, and that what was always sort of spoke about in the conspiracy world was that AZT battled AIDS by eating away at your DNA. Um, and so uh, I think it was the sort of burning down the house to sort of get rid of the burglars type thing. Um, whether that's, I don't believe that's true. Um, or, or, or I think it's vastly misunderstood if if there's even any element of truth to it. But essentially, Mickey Willis has got to be in his bonnet that his uh, brother succumbed to AZT. And because Fauci was the uh, um, was the uh, uh, director of the CDC, or, or whatever he was, director of health at the time, uh, he's he's had a grudge against Fauci since the 80s, just like uh, uh, Judy Mikovets. It's also the plot of uh, Dallas Buyers Club. Oh, is that what Dallas Buyers Club is about? Them getting AZT? Yes. Because it was so difficult to get hold of. Right. Okay, that makes sense. Like, um, yeah, um, it, again, it was, um, let's say, when, when it was first sort of um, achieved, because um, because at the time AIDS was so destructive uh, and, you know, it was, it was considered an almost certain death sentence, the, the, the availability of any of these drugs was, you know, it, it, people were willing to pay and such like that and uh, there just wasn't really enough to go around so it it's a bit of a, it's one of those really rather distasteful sort of like conspiracy theories really because it's just like well I mean the whole thing is you know the whole anti-vax stuff and that as well isn't it but like this sort of AIDS denial and anti-AIDS sort of thing is um, is really taking it to, to the next degree anyway so Mickey Willis has got this bee in his bonnet about um uh, about Fauci, um, and also, uh, as we discovered, um, because he was the subject of one of John Ronson's recent uh, podcasts, he's obsessed with this thing called The Hero's Journey, which was designed by uh, uh, an author called Joseph Campbell. I think there's 12 stages. I, I, I don't know that all the stages. Um, uh, you guys might. Essentially, it's this plot of Star Wars. You've got a reluctant hero who basically is told that he's a hero but doesn't want to do it, Something forces him into becoming a protagonist. There's something called a supernatural stage <laughs> where basically they get sort of a, a, a sort of almost deus ex machina sort of help. 
they'll go along, they'll get some success, they'll lose a, a, a significant battle um, in the third act, and that'll sort of rile them up to, to really sort of become the hero at the end. So if you've seen the plot of any Van Damme film or, or any um, Star Wars film or anything like that, where, well, that's what the protagonist does. This is the, the other thing that, that Joseph Campbell came up with. Yeah, he. Um, I should say, because I, I teach screenwriting, so Joseph Campbell's Hero's Journey is like a fundamental of storytelling. So it was originally in a book called A, a Hero with a Thousand Faces, and it was what he called a monomyth. So he looked at kind of storytelling from around the world, from like Aboriginal kind of storytelling through to like European fairy tales, and kind of worked out that every story fundamentally has this same thing, which is kind of what you said, Neil. It's about a hero. There is a problem. They need to fix that problem. They go out and fix it and come back a changed person. And um, <clears throat> Joseph Campbell uh, had, and called George um, Lucas like his his favourite student. Um, they actually knew each other. And when George Lucas was writing, it, it, like the draft was like 300 pages and then once he kind of came across Joseph Campbell's model, he used that. And a lot of films, um, there was a writer called Christopher Vogler who used to work at Disney. And he kind of, once he discovered Joseph Campbell, like Disney went mad. And so everything from like The Lion King to Aladdin, all of them follow this idea of the ma- of the protagonist and this journey. And you're dead right. Like this entire film is kind of the whole angle of it from like his brother dying of um, the AZT drug. And this this whole thing about his mother, there was like this really resentful, he kind of like, there was a lot of subtext here and a lot like uh, um, unexplored trauma, I think, because he was like, uh, he mentioned his mother knowing the difference between a hand up and a hand out. Like he was really resentful that she was on like benefits. And then, you know, he then mentioned that she died from... Um, going through like chemotherapy and it's literally the stuff about his mother the stuff about his brother all of that was just kind of establishing his politics yeah. and the whole thing he tried to angle it that it was about him going on this journey yeah but the but there wasn't no any work real... did it no <laughs> no like it, it... It was a good act one setup, <laughs> but there was no journey yeah. no he just really yeah i i thought that as well like it but yeah I do like the idea of that with the Disney thing, though. I've got this this brilliant idea. We're going to do this this hero's journey. Like we're going to do that. Like brilliant. And the executive just sat there and goes, "Is there any way we could spice it up? Could you kill all their parents at the beginning too? <laughs> you could. <laughs> brilliant. Then you know, I think we're in business. <sighs> and uh, yeah, I mean that's interesting as well because like a lot of the time, like with the Lion King and stuff like that, they say like you know, oh he's ripping off Hamlet, uh, or the, the narrative is Hamlet or whatever. It, 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 is that really just because no it's not it's the same yes. plot that is yeah. you know ubiquitous yeah. to everything essentially stories only really work fundamentally if there's a character a protagonist that has a problem that they need to fix and we live through that you know and and that is a framework how we kind of view the world as well i would say you know story narratives so like yeah the the hero's journey isn't just the, the the Hollywood films we consume is also how we, especially through conspiracy theories, center ourselves as being the hero trying to unlock or work out and figure out all the problems of the yeah, world. Yeah, totally. Not even conspiracy theories, just any sort of uh, activism. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. That, that's true too. Yeah. Well, he's he's most obvious. I was going to say in like the Q and on sort of stuff because you you know you're literally involved in a sort of. Uh, ongoing online investigation and stuff like that. So you are, you know, that. But it, but it, yeah, as, as, as you both say. I mean, there's an argument that is kind of, and I, I kind of believe this as well, that it's almost imprinted within our DNA. Like, if you think about it, when we go from, like, being inside a womb to actually coming out of the womb into the real world, that is actually one of the most monumental journeys. And you're almost going from a place of, like, darkness going through this this act to um, journey into this new world so you could say actually we're kind of imprinted with an idea of a narrative journey and certainly it's how it's not just conspiracy theories i would say it's all culture and it also sort of 
I don't want to get too dark too quick, but it's sort of like if you can put a narrative structure, it sort of kind of sort of like makes sense of this pointless debacle. All it is in this film is just a device. Well, I meant life, actually. I'm oh, just yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, you know, if we see ourselves as having narrative structures of something to achieve and something to do, it, it stops you from going, it's fucking pointless, this, isn't it? It, it stops you from having an existential crisis. I mean, Alan Moore, the writer, often talks about how we use like narratives um, b- because of the chaos of the universe. Yeah, it brings meaning and it brings yes. um, poignancy. And, you know, I, pers- and the, I, that's us as humans. That makes us, we are um, producers of culture and art in some respects. So, yeah, it is part of who we are. Ah, cool. So... So one was about Judy Mikovits. Um, two, I didn't see. Um, <laughs> like, if I'm brutally honest, I don't know if it's any good. I don't know if it went completely left, like Nightmare on Elm Street 2, and then it picked back up in 3, like Nightmare on Elm Street 3. Like, I don't know. <laughs> and we'll never yeah. know because I'm never going to watch it. <laughs> like, like yeah. it, So we'll just have to... I might look at the Wikipedia uh, thing and see what it says. I imagine it's more batshittery, basically. But but yeah, so Plandemic Three, um, the Great Awake. It was called the Great Awakening as well, wasn't it? Is that the the subtitle? Yep. That's that's very mid, isn't it? Like, do you know, what <laughs> there's it, nothing it, new in it, is it? No, and it, it's not even relevant to the the film. Okay, because there's no awakening. There's no sort of people coming round to things or anything like that in the film. They they lay out some stuff and very soon it becomes clear like oh i recognize some of this and then sort of pops up and we go all oh, right is that then <laughs> <laughs> but anyway but but there is no sort of awakening in the film so do you know what i mean like it, it's not the the title isn't really relevant unless it's his own awakening which happens like he explains in the first few minutes possibly yeah that might be it. There is the whole kind of final act where it's like, what should we do to to fix this problem? But I think you're right, Brent. It like again coming back to that personal bit as well as the mother and the brother. The other main thing was like this Bernie Sanders. Like he was involved in Bernie Sanders' campaign. Yeah. And I found this one of the weirdest moments because he basically says he didn't know anything about socialism or democratic socialism. And it's the guy, it's like, I was sat there going, wait a minute, have you just admitted that you're really stupid? <laughs> they do that a couple of times in the film, actually. Without a doubt, <laughs> yeah. Is it stupid or is it naive? No, 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 there's one bit that I've got, that they're definitely, they, that uh, they they in explicitly call themselves and the audience stupid by mistake, uh, which is perhaps an indication that they are actually stupid. But that's really interesting what you said, Brent, about the fact that the awakening is his awakening, which happens right at the beginning of the film, which says to me, take it on board with the fact that basically, as as, uh, Greg pointed out, there's no arc. Like, the film is, like, in his mind, done within the first five minutes, which indicates to me that he's a massive narcissist, which was, was obvious from, like, the first film, but he's basically got his, like, this is it, this set up my awakening, blah, blah, blah. And then he's gone, shit, we've only got five minutes there. Fuck, right, okay, we need to tag some stuff. Is there any way we could tag an hour and a half of other stuff on the back of that? And then it sort of starts to tell the story and whatnot. But, it, yeah, very bizarre. When I watched this, just before, I just wanted to say one thing. that there, there is one way I think this film could be genius. I want to add this as a caveat at the start, okay? If, like, when, when, they, when you mix films, there's different audio tracks... And I wished if they took out all the dialogue, so everything every, everyone said, if you took that out and watched this film only with the music track, I think it it would be like watching a horror film. It would be such a ride, and like, and, but it would be so surreal and it would be much more of an interesting experience. You would still come away pumped full of fear and emotively like a breaking point you'd get exactly the same thing but it would actually be way more enjoyable than listening to what the people are saying so i just wanted to add that caveat at the start well that's certainly true but one of my notes is the score is overblown melodramatic bollocks 
like which I think adequately sort of it was all swelling strings and everything was like oh Christ like it was really like they were they were really selling it weren't they they were trying to sell it basically and uh, and I guess this is where like when we talk about documentary like what we have to kind of like put into context is like all filmmaking whether fiction or non-fiction is all about manipulation yeah. and documentaries themselves aren't the like they don't just show truth. They don't just show reality. Like there's different modes of documentary, um, like how they're constructed, and and you. This is a complete manipulation from beginning to end. It's an overload. The music is at some points it's so on the nose and so cliche and cheesy, but like these guys like claim like they say at the start, history is a lie, a lie agreed upon, and it's just like really ironic because then it go it spends like ninety minutes. Lying to you. History, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Absolutely, man. It's like, yeah, it is uh, such a ridiculous thing. But, right, so right from the start, we know it's going to be crap because it opens with this sort of really sort of like shifted, sneaky appeal to unity where it basically says something along the lines of, I don't care what political party you are, what race you are, what vaccine status you are. And this is obviously rubbish because the the next hour and 40 minutes it is basically dedicated to slagging off one particular political ideology. Like, so if it's, I'm not sure that they would be like that sort of, um, uh, that, that sort of open to it. And then, so then it starts talking about, oh, well, I did this and blah, blah, blah. And, and you're right. It was, it, this, this really bizarre thing where he's almost like resentful of his mom. Um, and um, I, I put here, oh, my Christ, this is his story, isn't it? And then I put a, a note a bit later with an arrow going back to it, saying, no, no, it's not. It's much worse than this. He's just some sort of massive narcissist. So, yeah, so, you know. <laughs> but, yeah, he starts going on about how his mother um, was dependent on government assistance. And I re- immediately wrote a note, which may have been prescient, and said, I'm getting anti-commie vibes here. Boy, was were you in for like? Uh, <laughs> it definitely went Annie Comey, yeah. Well, yeah. He starts talking about this thing about um, the the trap of welfare, and and this started sort of. There's a degree of truth to this, right? Okay, in as much as basically, um, if you provide provide somebody with um a, a safety net. They don't have the necessity to go out um, and, and, and necessarily get a job because they won't starve to death. Um, now, personally, I'm in favour of that. I, I'm more in favour of like, okay, fine, fair enough. So it might encourage some people that don't want to sort of like or, or cannot better their situation to, to, to do that. Fine. We, there's enough money and enough resources in the world to do that. Like, I don't agree with, no, the. So they should earn that. They should they they should starve to death. They don't have the gumption to pull themselves up with their bootstraps like I did after a small loan from my father. <laughs> then, like, do you know what I mean? It's, it's always that attitude, and 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 this is ridiculous. So so this this trap of welfare is it's a very very right wing idea, and it speaks to sort of con- concepts of sort of hierarchies of people, and it implies that basically. If you're on welfare or you're taking benefits um, of any kind, the, the two things. One, that's a bad thing, which it isn't. And two, that somehow your fault, which is not the way to think of such a system. Um, are there some people that want to just like go, fine, I, I don't want to work, I'll just take this and blah, blah, blah. Yep, yeah, fine, fair enough, whatever. Like that's 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 cool. But this idea that it somehow sort of encourages laziness, you know what encourages laziness? Inherited wealth. Like, I've met some lazy people in my time, right, okay, and you know the people that basically, like, are forced to do two shitty jobs in order to sort of get themselves out of a, a naff estate or something like that, okay, i found that they're usually, uh, and always, in fact, like, far more go-getters than the people that basically, like, oh, I'll go on the gap year because Daddy and Marta said that we could do it this year, and I'm going to, I'm going to be a charitable worker in South America because... I, I spoke to Tarquin and he just said it was marvellous. Like, bollocks. Like, these nonsense. It, and, and, um, and it's a really nasty sort of concept. So immediately I was quite sort of worried that this, this film was going to be 
uh, not something that was to be aspired to. And then he starts talking about how all cancer treatments should be avoided and uh, and are toxic. And, and I thought, oh Christ, this is this is. Uh, and he ties it in again with his mother. And it's interesting what you said earlier, uh, uh, Greg, because he's almost like he's blaming his mum. Like, do you know what I mean? He had a real chip on his shoulder. Maybe that, like, you know, there's something more to that. Maybe he got picked on because his mum was on welfare or whatever. But we don't know his circumstances. He never explained why or what happened other than didn't uh, his, his dad sod off quite early or something. And, and he obviously had brothers. So, you know, I don't know. It seems like one of these things where, you know, if you picked at it a bit much, the anger that he's probably... I mean, I don't want to speculate, but I'm going to. Like, the, the anger that he's got for his father that is absent cannot be directed. But, you know, it can be directed at somebody who... Fauci. Well, A, Fauci, but B, his mother. And because basically several things. One, you're comfortable um, directing the anger at your mum because she's doing all these things to support you, which psychologically tells you that she loves you and she cares for you, which means that you can push her as far as you want and she won't abandon you like that shit which means that you can vent all this stuff at her. Um, and um, then she dies. Then she dies and abandons him. And, you know, so I can I can get it. I, I, I totally understand the position that you might be coming from, but it does seem to me that this man has got a lot of misdirected anger in his life. And then then he starts talking about, basically, that his, um, his, his brother died and he, and he puts it to AZT, the treatment for AIDS. And so now he's got another place to direct his anger and, and another sort of... I don't get me wrong, this guy's been kicked in the balls by life like a series of times, it, 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 if, if this backstory is true. Um, and it seems only normal and, and to a degree natural that like people would be looking for people to blame. But that doesn't necessarily mean that, that he's, he's doing the right thing here because it, it seems to me like that he is... He's, he's a very angry guy um, and... Uh, and uh, he wants to blame somebody. And it's so interesting, like how you said, like in the opening with this whole, like whatever political pie you identify with, you belong here, vaccinated or unvaccinated, it almost sets itself up as being really open and almost liberal, a middle ground, and then straight away goes into planting the seeds. Yeah, and shitting on people on welfare. And, and <laughs> yeah, like, yeah. Those idiots that die. And yeah, like, yeah. It, it go leads to this whole like individualism versus collectivism in like the third act, and and that is really like there's no sense. It doesn't believe in any solidarity amongst human beings. So oh, very much no, no. It really does just poison the wealth, right? Of like looking down and and criticizing people, even though it tries to make out it's completely open and welcoming. Well, absolutely, is it? And it's interesting though because the the sort of the welfare thing, um, uh, you know, famously, sort of the welfare state is also tied in with you know concepts of uh, uh, free healthcare uh, and uh, trade unions and things like this. And so there might be a bit of a hint as to why, for whatever reason, this guy is so anti the welfare state, basically. Um, and 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 it is confirmed straight away because. Uh, Gangster Edward Griffin comes on the screen and starts talking about a world communist plot. And at this point, we're like, bloody hell, this this is it. And Brent, you pointed out something really interesting that nobody spotted. Nobody spotted in the sort of the conspiracy world. Nobody spotted in the uh, 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 the, the debunker world. And that is the the role of gangster Edward Griffin. Yeah, absolutely. This guy is literally. I've been looking for this for a while. And I think I found it. And he is the missing link between the John Burt Society and the modern day conspiracy movement. Oh, very much so. I mean, like, yeah, absolutely. We we always thought that it was um, Alex Jones, right? Because we we spotted the the John Burt thing. The John Burt is the people that basically started the the idea of this world communist plot. Well, let's go back. It's, it's, it's sorry. It's it's actually. Um, Nesta Helen Webster, who starts the communist mm. plot, but he starts to do it as well, and he actually starts selling Nesta Helen Webster's books. Robert Welsh did, yes. The, oh, the right. John Burke okay. Society they started um, distributing uh, Webster's books, 
oh, so she was from like the 20s or whatever. Then in the 50s, he comes along and yeah, they start publishing her books. So like it's a direct link. Ah, so that's that's where he gets it from, basically. Yeah. Right, because I mean, the the John Birch Society, just to give you an idea of the, the sort of things that they're in, into, um, they they massively oppose collectivism of all types, uh, by which we, they basically just read, you know, team spirit, anything that's not just based solely on the individual the crab bucket stabbing people in the back mentality. For some reason, they're opposed to that, which is quite ironic because they are a society. Yeah. <laughs> like but but you know you can't have everything they also are opposed to communism and um big government um and they were genuinely sort of concerned of a, a world illuminati plot sometimes they say it's jewish certain people do i'll be fair to robert welch he, al- he always said it's not a jewish plot mm. it's the insiders yes <laughs> so that sounds like the Jews to me. Yeah, yeah, you know. Yes. And, uh, they're, yeah, they're also sort of, well, I'll put it this way, right? okay. They they oppose any type of big government, and they, they thought that the, the, the world sort of um, the communist plot was tied in with notions of Satanism as well. Um, and there is this concept that was sort of runs parallel about the synagogue of Satan and stuff like that, and, and they the, the society has been accused of of being very very anti semitic. Um, they're also openly, or the, they were openly racist, in as much as they support segregation um, and actively opposed the civil rights movement um, uh, in all forms. Um, they they just did not like that at all. Anything you think of like the culture war today, that was them. Well, this is the thing. Like, you know, Alex Jones's parents were um, um, uh, John Birch and I think his grandpa and stuff like that. Um, basically, they also oppose immigration. Um, they want to dismantle the, the Federal Reserve. They think that basically any sort of combined trade organization or trade agreement, like or any organization like the UN, NAFTA, uh, NATO, anything like that, is what is a step towards a one-world government. Ironically, NATO is there to combat communism or communist Russia, but let's not get bogged down in facts. They also see things like drugs, abortion, divorce, homosexuality, feminism, and pornography as symptoms of the moral decline of the West. So, as Brent's just pointed out, like the roots of the culture war, every single thing in the culture war actually came through the John Birch Society via three sort of outlets, essentially. One was the Tea Party movement. Four, actually. One was the Tea Party movement. One was Roger Ailes' Fox News, who basically wanted to promote attitudes that were connected to the Tea Party movement. The third is the Heritage Foundation, which was founded in the uh, 1980s by Paul Weyrich and um, the, the Koch brothers and uh, uh, people from the Cause family who were all members of the John Birch Society. And it was Paul Weyrich that founded the phrase cultural Marxism, uh, which is uh, sort of became a, a, a very sort of uh, large part of uh, the culture war. And also the Council for National Policy, which is a similar think tank, all came from this, this same group, basically. Absolutely. And the Koch brothers, their father was a founding member of the John Burr Society. Absolutely. As a, now, he's, this, is, this is a sketchy one. Whether he was a financier or whether he was, a, and he was certainly a friend of Robert Welsh, Fred Trump, Donald Trump's father as well, was. Um, it, it's very much debated as to whether he was in the John Birch Society. Roger Stone says that he financed them, and he was a good friend of uh, of, of members. Essentially, um, he was also potentially a member of the Ku Klux Klan. Was Fred Trump? Although that's never been proven, but there's a lot of circumstantial evidence that might point towards that being. Uh, potentially uh, a fact. Alex Jones said on Infowars that Trump is a John Birch Society president, and he once said that Donald Trump is more John Birch than the John Birch Society. Uh, so, hmm, who knows? But yeah, Charles and David Koch both has, um, d- followed in the footsteps of their father, Fred Koch, and were um, John Birch Society members. Um, 
They basically feel that American liberals are secret commie traitors um, and that there's a, there's a plot to uh, secretly install communism through things like uh, homosexuality, promiscuity, uh, mixing of races uh, and general sort of moral degradation. Um, they also, and this is a familiar one, since like this, since they started, they've been furiously angry that every year there's a there's an attack on Christmas, which is just there to <laughs> fundally, <laughs> fundamentally undermine uh, the religious aspect of America, which they believe to be a re- or want to be a republic, not a democracy, um, because well reasons basically they're like it, it seems to be connected with the idea that. D- a re- republics tend to favour the very, very wealthy. I don't know whether that's got anything to do with these oil barons' ideas about how they should be sort of ruled, but, uh, but you know, we- we'll see later. When I started looking into the John Burt Society like a few years back, like that was the one thing that really jumped out at me. All of a sudden I heard Robert Welch Jr. say a phrase that I had heard Jordan Maxwell say a hundred times. And he was said that, democracy means mob rule yeah and i was like oh holy shit that's a jordan maxwell thing it turns out jordan maxwell was like pen pals with one of the chapters but he never actually had joined but they have very very similar sort of like oh yeah certain this is the thing when you start to scratch the surface like i mean jim tucker wasn't really involved with them but again there's certain a lot of things that the basically i, I they're all racist. That's that. Like a lot of them are white supremacists, and a lot of them aren't very sort of like uh, subtle about it. Even like to be quite honest, I mean, as I say, they actively oppose uh, the civil rights movement. Basically, what I think is really fascinating. Um, first, I just think it's fascinating when, whenever I listen to you guys kind of unpack conspiracies because you like reveal the real conspiracies behind conspiracies, which is really fascinating. Um, But just as you were kind of saying that, Neil, and about obviously, you know, um, the racism, white supremacy, what is absolutely fascinating about this film is this film is uses race and it uses immigration and it uses ethnicity in a different way that you wouldn't expect. It isn't actually doesn't ever really make an anti-immigration point, even though it uses people that would have those opinions and even the opening, one of the opening shots is like, I don't know whether this is him. There's a lot, a lot of what I presume is like AI kind of generated stuff. It's like a white guy with a black woman with biracial kids. No, that's him. And then through, is that him? Yeah. Then throughout, like there's been a really conscientious decision that all the faces are multi-ethnic. And they're also later on, which I'm sure we'll get onto this, the use of like... um the immigrants from China, from the Falun Gong, um, uh, you know, persecuted from that. Again, he actually uses the voices of immigrants to to push a very pro-America, anti-communist. So it's really interesting how this film takes all of those politics we're talking about from like the John Birch Society, etc., but purposely kind of almost like it, it wants itself to appear more liberal, ironically, since this film just attacks liberalism throughout. Yeah, absolutely. Like, they're using these people, aren't they? Basically, it's, it, they, I hate to say this, but like, they almost use it as like, oh, this is my token black friend, which proves that I can't be racist. And it's like, oh, for crying out loud. Like, and, um, but, but yeah, it's, uh, yeah, like, uh, that is a very conscious decision, I think. That, because, it's a crazy thing, though. Like, if you unpick what it actually says in the film, everything's awful. So they've got to set it up as, yeah, we're not that bad. We're all right. <laughs> we're we're yeah. kind of nice. Just before we go, just to, to, to wind up, uh, the, the other things that the J. John Bush Society is, is famous for is they thought that President Dwight D. Eisenhower, the president, right, they thought he was a secret communist agent. I don't know... Why I've been spending all afternoon trying to find out, and basically I think it's because he what he do this thing called the New Deal, and they opposed that. I think that's it. I, I really think it's that. Basically, I mean, I should say, like from the outset, the fact uh, Mickey Willis, the filmmaker, says even when he worked on Ban- Bernie Sanders' campaign, 
He didn't know what socialism or democratic socialism, like the level of understanding of political ideologies in this film is almost below GCSE level. Like it literally, liberalism, consumerism, socialism, communism, it puts it all in as this massive just red scare. And it's just so, there's no real depth to it. Yeah, totally. To- I think that's why I asked like earlier, do you think his stupidity or naivete? Because that for me is how I fell for this whole, the left and the right is the two wings of the same bird, that sort of messaging and conspiracism. Like, cause I was very politically naive about any of these terms or even the spectrum I didn't really understand it at all, you know? So I think that it's going to appeal to people who don't understand the spectrum and it, it, like it, just like it did for me. Yeah. Well, well, well that's the, the thing, isn't it? It doesn't, what's ironic about it is they basically kind of tell you that like, you don't really even need to know about the spectrum because it's all fake. It's all bollocks. Like it's all fixed and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. However, if you are interested in it, there's this sort of one quite far to the right. And we think that you might enjoy that one. It's got God and it's got guns. Um, it's not so keen on certain people. But, you know, if you're going to pick one, pick that. That That's what they, they sort of say, basically. Right, so the, obviously the book, Non Dare Call It Conspiracy by Gary Allen, which is where we get our name, that also came from uh, the John Birch Society, which tells the plot of the... Um, coming world communist takeover and that is the book that started alex jones's career also um they oppose the water uh, the fluoridation of water uh, and sex education they go so far as to say that basically the fluoridation of water is a communist plot and um you know in dr strange love general ripper uh, the the bit we talks about our precious fluids apparently that was stanley kubrick taking the piss out of the john birch society the john birch society was so mental that even william buckley the person who threatened to uh, knock out Gore Vidal uh, live on television uh, thought that they were a little bit much, yeah. like, which is uh, yeah. which is slightly, which is quite telling, basically. Um, and also, uh, this is a, a hark back to classic, classic conspiracy time. The the two organisations that they fear the most are the Council for Foreign Relations and the Trilateral Commission, which is massively ironic once you understand that essentially the Heritage Foundation that came from the John Birch Society does all the things that they accuse the CFR and Trilateral Commission of doing. Um, now, the CFR and the Trilateral Commission, they're powerful lobbying organisations that help wealthy people. Like, they're not there to create a communist takeover of the world. But uh, hey-ho. But So Edward G. Griffin, he's had an interesting sort of life, basically. Born in 1931. Apparently, he became uh, a child voice actor and later um, uh, and later a voice uh, announcer on certain radios and stuff like that. So he was a little bit like our Graham from um uh there was the Silla Black show, uh a blind date. <laughs> yeah. So you can imagine Silla asking Graham, how did the day go? Well it was good, Silla, <laughs> but we've all got to be fearful of communists. <laughs> is that is that what the G stands for? It's Graham. <laughs> yeah. I'm loving it. He stands for George, sadly, not gangster. Oh. Although who knows? He's always gonna be gangster Griffin to us now. <laughs> yeah, he's always gonna be that. Like absolutely. Um, he was in the army for, from 1954 to 1956. In 1968, he became a writer for... Now, this is starting to give you a hint of, uh, of uh, Edward Griffin's character. Um, he became a writer for Curtis LeMay. Now, again, a Dr. Strangelove uh, connection. Doc General Ripper, the insane, warmongering uh, lunatic that decides to set about um, a mutual assured destruction and is concerned about the fluoridation of the water is based on Curtis LeMay. Curtis LeMay was a very controversial figure um, uh, in the US military. Um, some think he's great, some think he's a lunatic. Uh, it doesn't matter. He was basically being the vice presidential candidate for George Wallace. George Wallace was a racist, segregationist, populist. Um, and um, ve- massively opposed um, uh, uh, mixing of races in any form, and that's who Edward G. Griffin was working with. G. Basically. Edward, 
Uh, yeah, G. Edward Griffin. Why does he? Why does he say G. Edward? I don't. Uh, that's annoying, isn't it? Like, <laughs> to throw people off. <laughs> yeah, basically. So he became an editor of the John Birch Society man, uh, magazine called The New American. Uh, and in 1969, he, re- he he did the presentation, which is littered throughout this film, which is called The More Deadly Than War, The Communist Revolution in Russia. In 1973, and this is, again, to show the connections that he's got, the, these are all going to be things that people who are familiar with conspiracies recognise. In 1973, he published a book called A World Without Cancer, which talks about using latriol take from apricot kernels in order to naturally cause cancer. Like, uh, people have tried this, it doesn't work. It just doesn't work. It's nonsense. In fact, you can actually give yourself poisoning by taking too much of this stuff because it's got... Is it anthrax? No, it's... Cyanide. Cyanide, thank you. Right, okay, so this is the point. You can actually kill yourself by doing this stupid quack medicine. Um, in 1992... He went looking for Noah's Ark. Okay, cool. And he and he cl- he claims to have found it, but but he couldn't get to it or some shit or was that in Turkey, Mount Ararat? Yeah, it was round there. Uh, and, and trust me, bro. Apparently, like he definitely, definitely um, uh, exists and is a real thing. In 1994, he did his most famous book, which is called The Creature from Jekyll Island, which talks about the meeting where all these conspiring bankers, some of whom happen to be of a certain specific faith, got together in order to basically make the Federal Reserve. And the point of the Federal Reserve is that it cheats everybody out of money and money isn't real. It's all a promissory note. And uh, basically, it's some sort of system to keep us enslaved forever. Um, and in that book, um, he came up with the the Rothschild quote, Maya Amisha Rothschild, uh, let me print the money and I care not who makes the rules. And this is apparently according to Mike Rothschild, friend of the show and all round uh, great author. Um, he uh, says that this is the first time uh, that this uh, quote is attributed to the Rothschild. It's a completely made up quote. It's, it's absolute bullshit, but it is the backbone of David Icke's career. Like, it is also, like, I'm telling you, like, it underpins everything that he talks about, about the global cabal and Sabbatian Frankists. And if you take out, like, because in the Sabbatian Frankist thing, the, the, there's this evidence which is somewhat said that the Sabbatian Frankists met up with the Rothschilds and it, basically that's how the cult got sort of global uh, sort of domination. Now, none of this works if if the canards about the Rothschilds aren't true. And they're not. They're not. They're just not true. They didn't finance both wars. Hitler actually stole all their money. They didn't make a killing off the Battle of Waterloo and short the pound. They don't own um, the Bank of England. They aren't the wealthiest family on the planet. They're not even in the top ten. Like, they're just not. They're just nowhere, basically. Um, and most of the the sort of stuff came from either sort of middle medieval anti Jewish sentiment um, or uh, Nazi gen, abs, absolute Nazi propaganda, like the film De Rothschild. Uh, so, and this is again, this is the foundation of much of the conspiracy world. Oh, we're not being anti Semitic. We're just talking about this specific Jewish banking family, and it transpires that none of that's true, basically. But it looks like it was G. Edward Griffin that actually came up with that. Um, Other things that basically, like, his influence in the early 2000s, he became very, very sort of uh, big on the AIDS denialism movement, claiming that HIV doesn't exist. Um, And um, in 2012, he appeared, and I think he financed as well. Yes, he did. White Wats. Yes, he did. What in the world are they spraying? The, um, The seminal chemtrails documentary it wasn't the first time that chemtrails was, was mentioned that was by a bloke called william wallace who then gave it to some journalist who then appeared on art bell uh but this was the first major film that talked about uh chemtrails and it is the one that most people reference because they say it's aluminium and strontium and barium and we know this because we got it from the soil samples well if you go and listen to our chemtrails um deep dive you'll find out exactly why that was um, uh, false information and where they went wrong with that. 
Uh, and since then, basically, he's been sort of like a major figure in, in sort of all you sort of, every documentary they'll have him sort of show up. Um, you know, the sort of, when it, when it was the DVD era um, of uh, uh, of conspiracies, he was on that. He's always on Info Wars. And um, in fact, even recently, I think um, Alex Jones referenced him as one of his heroes. Um, and uh, yeah, so uh, Brent's right. Like, G. Edward Griffin is... The he's the conduit between all these wacky, stupid ideas of the John Birch Society and modern day conspiracism, and like in so many directions, either directly through people like Alex Jones, people that have come out of that sort of stable, or through the ideas of Rothschild banking and stuff like that. Um, he's influenced David Icke because of that, and 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 you know, again, that is is, is the sort of underpinning of the new world order conspiracy theory. Totally. He's been on uh, Coast to Coast AM seven times. Wow. As well, talking about, obviously, the Federal Reserve and all of that. Yeah. But his most recent one was in May 2020. Oh, yeah. Talking about the coronavirus was a hoax. Oh, for Christ's sake. He was on it that early. Saying it was a hoax that early. Yep. Yeah. That's ridiculous as well. Yeah. Right. Well, so so that gives you an idea of what the film is going to be like, basically. So G. Edward Griffin turns up and basically tells us that there's a world communist plot. And this is, again, like, he's just silliness and he's just absolute nonsense. But he's going to try and explain uh, what it is. And, and he tells us in a really sort of like shocked and sort of ah, that history has been rewritten. Um, he doesn't massively elaborate on this, but basically, it, the next sort of thing that he says, he goes on to say, socialism is a transitional stage to communism and so what he's saying is that basically we can't trust and this sort of explains what they're talking about with the welfare and stuff like that can't trust socialism why socialism right capitalism is unfettered capitalism is basically like people own capitalist capital capitalists and they basically get workers to work for them and they're the tops at the top there's the plebs at the bottom and and that's it that's unfettered capitalism in socialism it is within the system of capitalism but it has a safety net sort of say things like free health care free schooling um uh, fire brigade um free uh, police force Things like that. Systems that are there to protect um, the, the, the people. And so basically what it says is that basically nobody, it doesn't stop you from becoming incredibly wealthy, but it hopes to stop people from falling into, falling into extreme poverty. And that's all that socialism wants to do. Communism has private property and capital taken from capitalists and redistributed through the mechanism of the state to the general people. And Marx thought that socialism was wimpy. Marx thought that basically socialism wouldn't really cut it because there's no incentive for capitalists to give up their capital. Um, they just don't have to. Like this, this is we see this. This is why people like Elon Musk exist. And so Marx felt that the only way to sort of solve this was not to hope for sort of charitable sort of outlay, was to have a violent revolution where we killed all those people, took their money and redistributed it to, to normal people. Now, communism as a system never seems to really work because basically the, there's a stage before the utopia stage where someone has to be a dictator in order to sort of transition this mechanism, uh, this, this revolution into, into being. And often is the case is that when people are a dictator, they discover that it's quite fun to be the dictator. And they don't necessarily want to give it, give everything up, uh, and so they'll do all sorts of justifications to to not do that. Basically, so to quote Mel Brooks, "It's good to be the king." Exactly, <laughs> this is it. Like, but um, but but what Edward G. G. Edward Griffin is saying, and this is is that basically all of these things, these giving people a chance and helping people out, is a slippery slope towards um, communism. And I, I'll reiterate at this, the point that they actually hate communism because of these these systems, but it's not really that. It's because communism had strong workers' rights, trade unions. And so they what they did was they, they tried to demonise trade unions. And this is, there will be anybody that grew up in the era of Thatcher will be very, very sort of um, uh, reminiscent of this. Demonising trade unions as corrupt organisations, which often sometimes they became, you know, any organisation has that ability. 
but in order to take away the rights from the workers, and this is what capitalism sort of yearns for, the exploitation of the masses. In fact, and I don't want to come across as all uh, far left, but capitalism de- depends on exploitation. You need to get somebody to work and to create more than you pay them in order for you to be profitable as an organisation. And so, essentially, exploitation underpins capitalism. I should just kind of add, like, I think some excellent kind of summaries there, Neil. And just, you know, with like Thatcherism and Reagan during that period of like the late 70s into the 80s, was that was a, a new period of capitalism, which is neoliberalism yes. and uh, and where things kind of change from this old model. And a lot of Marx's um, analysis was based on the industrial capitalism, whereas now we actually we, we've shifted into neoliberalism. And I think what this film really fails to kind of understand is the differences uh, between things like neoliberalism um, and communism and and literally equates the two things together in a very simple way. Well, uh, the other thing that we've got, which is also sort of gives you an idea of sort of the exploitative nature of capitalism, is that we've got privatisation now, which what happened was basically, again, with the Reagan-Thatcher era, they said, look, we've got... the public, when we run this, we just we what was it? Oh, we bugger up all these things. What we do, we get these experts in these companies that come in, and that basically because their profitability is dependent on them delivering goods and services in a in a in a good way, they're bound to be better than if the government is responsible for this, and that is balls. Because it just doesn't, because what happens is that the, basically the corporations become so powerful and such sort of lobbying interests are so wealthy that they basically go, we're in a monopoly now. And the best example of this is the train service in the UK, which is shit and massively expensive. Because a private company has been put in charge, they can, they can get away with it because they realise that basically, like, what are you going to do? This is our infrastructure, essentially. You can't have this. And we're going to continue. We've got you by the balls, essentially. And so, uh, and people knew this when this sort of privatization and and Thatcher Reaganite sort of era of of capitalism was going on. But the reason that basically they got away with it is because it was going to make them and all their mates really, really rich. And that's exactly what happened. And that's why it continues. And, and, And we now live in a hellscape. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, just to add on to the the idea of like the privatized privatization of industries, is again later on this film doesn't understand the the concept of disaster capitalism, which was really well kind of described by Naomi Klein in her book. And um, if anyone's read Doppelganger as well, which is about conspiracism, which is again really brilliant. Uh, these guy in this film it makes this uh, argument that like when crises happen, so like COVID, for example. That they, this is a, a secret ploy for the the people, you know, for this conspiracy to to bring in communism. But it just doesn't understand that yeah. this is disaster capitalism. When there's a problem, people would jump in to make profit to fix it. Like that's how capitalism works. Well, it seems strange, doesn't it? Because it very early takes sort of like aim at Pfizer, and it's like, sorry, they're one of the largest companies on the planet, right? Okay, that I'm pretty sure they're not interested in communism in no, any way. Absolutely, nor the World Economic <laughs> Forum, nor is Bill Gates, nor <laughs> any of these people, basically. But uh, it's ridiculous. What I found about this statement that he makes of socialism is this: it's a step towards communism, or whatever. It's basically the slippery slope fallacy. And I thought to myself, well, you could actually flip that around the other other way, mate. Like, if you want to use a slippery slope fallacy, you could say, well, conservatism is a slippery slope to fascism. Yeah. You know, but it's, it's just not necessarily... And, and there's a lot more evidence to support that <laughs> argument than <laughs> yeah. communism. And I'll tell you that for nothing, right? <laughs> so then they go on about how Canada is terrible and they show some right-wing twats being beaten up for cops for stupid COVID protests. And then they whinge for a long time about the trucker protests, which, by the way, were arranged by non-truckers and... Here's the thing that people don't realise. It wasn't an anti-COVID thing. It was a political thing. They wanted to dissolve the federal government because they think that um, uh, that Justin Trudeau is a communist. Some of them even think that um, uh, Castro is his secret father because they're idiots. <laughs> um, but, but, yeah, and he also did, and the film goes ahead to say that uh, 
um, Trudeau is a, a literal dictator of China, of, sorry, of uh, Canada. And the reason that they know this is because he says that he likes China. And, and he's like, what? I, I don't, I guess. Where, where, even with that. So again, they've already started lying about people's political movements and the intent of the trucker protest and the the people who were behind it uh, and stuff like that. And yeah, ridiculous. I found this whole Canada thing like absolutely surreal. It was like it comes from a moment of Jim Carrey like talking about his Nike shoes and about Canada having free healthcare, and then it cuts to like again a pure manipulation. It cuts to footage of the police beating up demonstrators as if it's a dictatorship. And all I did was, like, when watching it, it's like, you could literally do that about any state. You could find footage of any country. That's what the police do. And I think this is, again, where it misunderstands nuance of political ideology. It literally compares um, Trudeau's Canada with communist China, and it's like, yes, bo- both can be authoritarian, both can police can like beat people at times, but but they actually are vastly kind of different politically it's as well. Hugely different, completely different. Some might say. I mean, there was footage of BLM protesters getting beat up. Yeah, you know, what I mean, we could have they could have cut that into it. It's very selective. Yeah, but they won't because they don't support that movement. Well, this is it, and and that does come up later on, basically. So, um. Then he started. The other thing is like Canada. Right? What's ironic about this is a lot of the sort of people that say Canada is a literal commie slash Nazi dictatorship, and it's like your Trump supporters. Trump has actively promoted fascist policies and and spoken fascist rhetoric, not hyperbolically, because he knows it appeals to this audience who, for some reason think they're fighting Nazis, except for the ones that know they're Nazis, that proudly wave the Nazi flags and stuff like that. It's such a bizarre sort of setup, and I don't get it. And it's like, you know, they they do say that, like, Canada is this just absolute authoritarian hellhole. It's like, you know, Blade Runner, or God knows, or some, what, some sort of 1984 or something like that. And I've been to Canada... And I know people that live in Canada and they all say it's really nice. And I found it really nice. So I don't know who to believe. Like, it, like I'm, I'm torn. But then, just to prove that they're not being hysterical, they start talking about how the World Economic Forum... So, not communism then, because it's the World Economic Forum. But... Let's not, it's a lobbying organisation of some of the largest fucking businesses on the planet that promotes stakeholder capitalism. It's as far from, like, communism as you can. But they're concerned that not only is it going to introduce a world communist state, but also that Klaus Schwab is a Nazi. This was, like, one of the weirdest moments, right, when it brought up the fear of the reset, and then it has, like, this cut, and the music is bonkers, and it's this footage of... Klaus Schwab wearing that like weird costume and it just and literally it then has images of Nazis and it's like just setting this up it's bonkers it took me a while I was sat there and I was like the fuck is this and I can't remember <laughs> whether somebody mentioned something or they showed something I think they showed something that said NSDAP or something like that and I went oh I get it this is because they're appealing to a certain thing it's Nazis were national socialists and so it's all the same thing, and it's like, it couldn't be more different. Yes, they were originally called the National Socialist Workers' Party of Germany because they wanted to appeal to workers and uh, essentially, the, you know, the, the, the working man because that's where you got the votes. But they couldn't be more anti-socialist if they tried. They killed socialists. They shut down um, trade unions, and they got massive organisations like IB Farben and TS and Steel they're essentially a, a, like a corporatist uh, society where corporations had a huge say in the running of uh, or uh, a huge influence uh, on the country. So there were capitalists, capitalist far right. They couldn't be far further removed from socialism. They used the name to appeal to people initially, and that was it. Uh, and he, yeah, so so again, but that's what they're trying to do. They're trying to basically say. It's that stupid fucking internet argument of Nazis were communists and communists are bad. 
But Nazis aren't bad because Nazis oppose communists. But I thought they were. Like, oh, yeah. It's nonsense, <laughs> right? It's nonsense. And as you've just brought up, the um, interesting costume that he is wearing. Someone asked me before, like, oh, can you guys, like, clarify certain things as we go along? You know, because we don't really know everything you're talking about. Like, there's often this pictures of Klaus Schwab in this weird, allegedly weird outfit. In reality, it's was it a Lithuanian? Yeah, it's the uh, it's the university robes of uh, of a university somewhere in Eastern Europe. I think it's Lithuanian. Uh, and he's receiving, a, I think it might be, and he's receiving an honorary doctorate, and that's why they're all dressed. And, and let's be honest, it does look rather strange and stuff like that. But you know what? A, mor- a mortarboard there you go. cloak looks bizarre. Exactly. I would just also, as a fan of your show, I would recommend your deep dive on the World Economic Forum and about stakeholder capitalism and shareholder capitalism and loved the uh, euphemism of, I think it was the Sopranos versus was the, the Wire. Yeah. yeah, like like I really do, because at the moment, like, you know, in the world of conspiracism, the World Economic Forum has been this huge thing that people have spoken about. But I, I would just say to other listeners, I loved your show on that. It, it gave me so much information because, you know, I've been in situations where I, I stayed at an Airbnb once and the guy that ran it started talking to me about the World Economic Forum. And I was like, oh, no, here we go. <laughs> so, like, it really, when that came up in this film and it was going there, I actually thought, wicked, thank you for arming me with, like, actual information and facts. So, yeah, highly recommend your deep dive on that, guys. Thank you. Great stuff. But basically what they, they start to say is that um, they, they show the sort of um, the Klaus Schwab, we penetrate the cabinets and saying that everyone should be vaccinated. Now, just to make it absolutely clear, right, the World Economic Forum is a lobbying organisation. It is not without its problems. Um, essentially, that basically lobbying allows uh, large corporations to get in the ear of politicians and, and basically it, it benefits the super wealthy. But it's not communist and they're not looking to create a world government and they aren't really penetrating the governments like Klaus Schwab boasted. He's, he was basically bragging at this meeting. Um, and they're also not actually interested in doing any of the things that people, that they say they're interested in. Like they, they sort of make sort of very sort of like basic sort of uh, leaning towards, oh, we should probably do something about the environment. We should probably do something about workers conditions and workers rights we should probably do something about the third world they're not going to do anything about it in fact the corporations that lobby the world economic forum are the ones that are causing these problems what the world economic forum is there to do is to present a positive image for a load of nefarious capitalist bastards and in that sense it's a bad thing but it certainly isn't the illuminati um and um it isn't uh, looking to change society in any way uh, other than to make themselves increasingly richer as time goes on. But they start talking about the Great Reset and, and the Great Reset has been p- pinned as this thing that was connected to COVID. It was an opportunity to um, reset the world into a quasi-socialist state. It's not, it's capitalism. You get everything for free. You get all your products for free and bec- because basically... Um, everything is so plentiful. In fact, that's not even the Great Reset. I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself, right? Okay. The Great Reset was a fucking Duller's Dishwater uh, book by Klaus Schwab that essentially says, um, you know, in the future, this might happen. If this happens, this is a way to make money out of it. In the future, this might happen. If that happens, it might be a way to make money out of it. What he's been done is mashed together with this essay by this Dutch teacher called Ida Alken that was asked to write a thought experiment about a potential future where everything was free, goods and services were free because the planet is so profitable. And she did. She didn't, she didn't have, it wasn't a policy idea. She's a teacher in a school in Holland. She's got no power. She didn't even say that she liked it. She just came up with an idea this is one possible future. Here's the good things, here's the bad things. 
it's not it's not real in the sense that everybody's concerned about it but according to pandemic 3 it's this nazi commie takeover of the world that will ultimately be a one world government uh, according to someone called david e martin that is quasi socialist also it pointed out that basically the great reset like that concept because they always call their yearly conferences something that sounds like they're they're going to do some good that that never comes about right okay the great reset was in 2014 the ida alkin article came out in 2016 when the fuck are these things going to happen like they they very they had the perfect opportunity apparently that's what the conspiracy says with covid which was all fake to make this happen and then they dropped the fucking ball with it apparently like what and isn't it fascinating that these are like almost marketing buzzwords of course that, they are, like yeah. that they that have been used to probably like brand themselves and yet people have actually swallowed that and actually not actually critiqued that it's actually bullshit <laughs> and actually have swallowed that and, and and amplified it or magnified it as being a much bigger scary thing Interesting you say that because that's exactly what they go on to do. They misrepresent the Chinese social credit system, which, by the way, when it says social credit, there's this myth in conspiracy circles and right-wing circles that what this Chinese thing is is through facial technology, if you pet a cat, you get points. If you (laughs) kick a cat, you get points taken off. Uh, And it's stuff like if you say something dissenting of the government, you get points taken off. If you help an old lady across the road, you get points taken off. If that old lady... So it begs the question, if that old lady was was saying dissenting things about the government and you didn't help her across the road, would you get points? <laughs> Who can say? <laughs> There's even bullshit like basically your social credit is connected to your phone and if you stand next to somebody who's got low social credit, you'll get an alarm. And if you don't move out of the area, your credit rating will go down. Now, none of this is true. None of it is true at all. What the Chinese social credit system is, is it's very akin to our credit system. You know, your credit, like, which basically means how much loans you can take out and whether you're eligible for a mortgage and um, certain products, how whether you can get, like, pay monthly and that type of thing, direct debits, things like this. Okay. In China, there is a, a cultural problem with people not paying debts. I don't understand it. I, I don't know enough about it to say any more than that. But this was felt sufficient that basically if people are highly in debt, the social credit system stops them doing things that would get them more in debt and also stops them paying for certain what would be considered luxury items like high end plane tickets and stuff like that. So personally, I don't agree with it. I don't agree with that. I, th- I I wouldn't want that system in this country. But it has been massively, massively misrepresented by the conspiracy crowd as to be almost like... You ever seen the Scanner Darkly, where basically they're following him through the CCTV and basically they're listening to his phone call and they figure out like that he's buying drugs and they're, they're like, she's hovering over the shell, like, arrest him or not, but and, and it's not like that at all. It, it just isn't. They do also have a facial recognition technology thing which has picked people out of stadiums and stuff like that for like traffic fines and whatnot Uh, and they do also shame people publicly with like this person has done this and done uh, jaywalking and things like that in in the things uh, in the like public but again the culture is different and so those things are more effective if you try to like can you imagine if you put kids with asbos on fucking like um on, on uh, like you know in Piccadilly Circus or whatever they'd fucking love it yeah people would take that as a badge of honour in this country <laughs> hey initiates it's me Brent Lee just a quick intermission here before we get back into the episode to tell you about our new and improved Patreon we've added a brand new initiate tier for those of you who want to listen to some dare call it conspiracy without the ads This entry-level tier is only £2 a month. Or join our second-level tier and become a shill for just £4.50 a month. Not only will you get ad-free episodes of the podcast, you'll also have early access to every new episode up to a week before they're released to the public. And a premium episode made only for Patreons every month. Also included 
is a welcome pack of our previous content. Neil is giving you four of his books, including Now's the Only Thing That's Real, a re-examination of the Manson murders, motives, and mythos. I have got eight albums to give you from my time back as a producer and rapper. And the great Nicholas C. Gray is giving you a copy of Headache Comics 4. Plus, an invitation to join our private Discord where you can chat to the Some Dare Call It community. And finally, the Handler tier. For £9 a month, you'll get everything I've already mentioned. But you'll also get an invitation to join us live every time we record an episode. You can hop in the chat and ask us or our guests anything during the session. And you'll get to see everything that goes on behind the scenes, including all of Neil's hot takes that I have to cut out of the final mix. So, please, if you can, do consider joining us on patreon.com slash some dare call it conspiracy. Now, let's get back to the show. And who else doesn't like it? Oh, yes, sorry, absolutely. The World Economic Forum and George Soros on multiple occasions have come out saying that the Chinese credit system is bad and they don't like it. Yep. Now, you could make the argument that this is a double bluff, but it totally goes against the idea that they are advocating for this, which Alex Jones, David Icke, and all of these people will tell you that the World Economic Forum is pushing to have these types of systems. It, it isn't. It, it, who knows if in private, when the demons speak to them, that's what they want. But their public position is that all of those things, they are absolutely opposed to them. I mean, it's, it's fascinating hearing about that. Just to kind of like add on to, um, you know, I think what's interesting with this film, there are moments where, like with all conspiracy theories, there is valid criticism. Like, off the back of the, the Chinese credit system, it then shows, like, some of the totalitar- totalitarian examples of how China responded to COVID. And I think, like, and even earlier on, like, even the, the freezing of bank accounts of protesters is a dangerous civil rights um, issue. Whether you agree with those protesters or not, um, you know, to me, it's a is a dangerous place in terms of civil rights. So there are there are elements of truth, um, or, or that this, and even later on when it gets onto like um, I think the Falun Gong, um, you know, some of that stuff is heartbreaking. Uh, some of the persecutions people uh, have experienced. So it's interesting that there's a thread of stuff in there, based absolutely all then laid like based around fabrication. And and before the Chinese credit system, it kind of linked um, like the World Economic Forum and Klaus Schwab, China being his model. But it also then threw in, there was kind of a link just before it got to the Chinese credit system of AI and technology. Uh, yeah. the, guy, the guy from the Sapiens book who all these That's conspiracy Yuval theories Hari. hate. Yeah, it's on that science and evolution. And then it claimed that China is gathering our DNA via covid tests um and then that all linked kind of the to the chinese credit system like all of this was just mashed in together as one thing well it's just a big sci-fi gish gallop isn't it basically yeah. like they're just they're, they're throwing shit at the wall and hoping that something scares you or overwhelms you basically but at this point like it, this is when they call themselves and the entire audience stupid because they have somebody on who basically says that strangely it's intelligent people that seem to fall for this authoritarian system that they they just can't see through it because they go on to say that basically it's this blind belief of institutions and it ties in with the the, the idea that education is indoctrinating and so they basically they, what they're saying is all this book learning all this so-called intelligence institutionalize people uh, and the uh, education is a government program that teaches you to believe the official story it was like frightening to be honest the anti um, intellectualism that started coming out of the film like i was shocked when when it actually said about actually it's the intelligent people that they're the most tricked and, like i work in universities I, I i teach as an associate lecturer it has no understanding of people that like do like degrees or MAs, there is lots of critical thinking. They don't 
oof. And arguing. Yes, yeah, and yeah. debating, like healthy debating. And I have to say, at this point in the film, um, it was, I don't think it was this guy that said this stuff about intelligent people. There was another guy before him as well, I think Professor Matthias Desmet. Um, and, and in his opening line was he told you his qualifications, yeah. like how he was trained. I actually, have you seen like Brass Eye or the day to day? Oh, yes. I, I thought this, and as it went into like, yes, intelligent people, they're the most like uh, uh, ignorant. I actually thought, I, I, I questioned, is this a joke? Like, is this actually serious? Because <laughs> it seemed like farcical. Well, they're also calling themselves stupid because they they can see through it, so they're not intelligent. Uh, there's several points. One, they're calling themselves stupid. <laughs> Two, it shows that they have no understanding uh, of what happens once you get past secondary level education, uh, and they're just demonising it in a way that, that absolutely doesn't work. And then, basically, they started to fetishise um, the working man, and that blew my fucking mind, because this is an anti-communist film, and the fetishization of the working man and the persecution of the intellectual crowd perfectly mirrors certain things that Stalin did and the Khmer Rouge <laughs> yeah. did and, and various other communist regimes did. And it's like, they don't realise this. They, 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 they just didn't realise what they were fucking doing there. Like, and, and yeah, it was ridiculous. It was, it was very akin to communist anti-academic um, fetishization of the workers, like is bizarre. But, but again, this whole film is contradictory. Like, just to go back to that first point of like how it used that quote about history is a lie. Yeah, it then goes on to kind of completely fabricate history. Like this, this film like scares you about totalitarianism and all that, but actually itself like paves the way potentially by some of the ideas it's putting out there for totalitarianism. Well, it, it's interesting Crazy. you say because because then that sort of poison dwarf Zelenko comes on and starts talking about how um, fear is psychological warfare, and he's implying that COVID is 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 the the mechanism for this. And it says that fear stops you thinking, and it was at this point that I thought <laughs> this is the third film in a series. Telling people about it's like a fake pandemic that has been designed to slave them into a communist system where they have to eat bugs and might die from taking vaccinations, and they're lecturing us about how basically fear stops you from thinking. That's some balls there. Yeah, they're giving the game away, aren't they? <laughs> Isn't it? Like you very much say. So. Like, um, yeah, I mean, what is more fearful than, like, they're trying to enslave humanity, and if you take the medicine, you'll die. Like, this, this, it's a fairly high-tension situation that they're promoting. And again, it, it was just strange how, like, they, they kind of um, project this view that everyone is so stupid that followed the, the rules of, like, whether lockdown or vaccinations. Yeah. But again, as I'm watching this, I'm like, there's no real understanding of reality, because no. I... I don't, you know, I have criticisms of the pharmaceutical industry, of the state, of the government, of authority. But you know what? I can also make a judgment during a public health crisis that actually to, to stay inside, to look out for each other and to get vaccinated is actually a clever thing to do. So people did think for themselves, but they just didn't happen to follow what Mickey Willis and all these other people ironically want them all to follow. Well, ironically, the film basically says that people got connected through the COVID experience, missing the idea that basically this is exactly what radicalised all these twats online, that basically, <laughs> like, they found a like-minded community that created this incredible LARP where they're the hero, as opposed to some nincompoop that just got a bit of a fanny about a medicine that they didn't want to take. Like, that... and. So again, the lack of self-awareness in this documentary was astonishing. You had twats coming on like J.P. Sears saying, basically, there's all these people that think they're doing the right thing, but they're actually doing the wrong thing. And it's like, you don't say. Like, <laughs> the, like the irony train just does not stop at this film station at all. It was ridiculous. But what they're doing in this bit is they're framing COVID denialists as rebels against the system. Like... Like, which is, again, ironic because 
Like, because <laughs> again, if you want to go back to the the, the uh, Joseph Campbell idea, the rebels are the um, the you know the rebels in uh, Luke Skywalker and stuff like that. Famously, George Lucas based them on the Viet Cong. Yep. <laughs> so th- this guy's got all these metaphors and all these ideas mixed up and so matched together that it's just ridiculous. Mentioning that JP series, this is something that actually was one of the things that was really annoying me about this documentary. And it was when they put him up, his name up, and they did this with with they did this with all the men. All right. They didn't actually do this with any of the women. But every single man that came up when it had like their occupation, had their name and occupation, it always listed father first. <laughs> I didn't spot that. <laughs> So it was father, comedian. Bizarre. So same with yeah. Mickey Willis. It was like when he introduced yeah. himself, he said, "I'm a father, a husband, and a filmmaker." Oh, Every God. single time, and I just kept thinking, like, so what? Because I'm not a father, my voice isn't valid. Is that what you're trying to say? You know, but obviously we know what it ties in with the the the, the trad con kind of yeah. mythology, but still. Like, every time one of those names popped up, I was pissed. I was like, what, what, you assholes. Like, seriously. <laughs> that's, that's, that's fair. I hadn't spotted that, um, to be quite honest. But, but yeah. Then Sir Wood pops up. It, it tells us that living in Maoist China was horrible. And, um, and it lists a whole series of things about how uh, China was terrible. Um, because apparently they all look a bit asexual which was a less than subtle dig at trans people. Um, and um, and China's atheist. Oh, my God. Like, and so that, <laughs> that was a, a big thing. And they basically say that it got the youngster to believe the state over their parents, which is very, very clearly a sort of reference to sort of Greta Thunberg and that type of sort mm-hmm. of environmental yeah. thing. And, and the trans um, stuff. Because the teachers don't tell the parents that that's what they'll mm-hmm. bring into as well. So it's kind of a reference to the trans kids as well. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And Very was much that so. the, was this one of the ladies from the Falun Gong? The, no, it was the lady that's, that was not, she's not political. Okay. We'll get to her later. We'll get to her later. <laughs> Are you sure? Well, uh, yeah, fair enough. Um, Cause she closes out. So we'll get to her later. Oh, does she? Does she? Right. Okay, cool. But what was interesting, just going into this point, was they they kind of set themselves up as um, victims. They they did go. Oh Christ! Film went through a whole beat of because they didn't get vaccinated, they got bullied, persecuted. Yeah, Yeah. persecuted. They very much set themselves up. But it was um, the woman was Lily Tang Williams, who was the speaker here. Who isn't? I don't believe she's part of the Falun Gong, but she was. Like I said earlier, she was this real device here to use this kind of immigrant voice. And again, you know, probably some valid criticisms of what she's experienced in China. But it was then it just made this leap of suddenly it was like, and they want everything to be no gender, asexual. And it's like, oh, my God, is it really going there? It it just really wanted to link with all the anti-transphobic stuff. It was so obvious. In her defense, she did make it completely clear that she is in no way political. Yeah. Just like. (laughs) She then went on to say that woke is communism, which is an obvious dog whistle to cultural Marxism um, and is also completely not true. I mean, she, she literally just talks about how oppressive the communist state was that she escaped from. And it's like, how do you think, like, how do you think like a Sam Smith would go across in, in that regime that she's talking about? Do, 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 do you think, you know, zhuzhing up? Your asexual atheist like uh, workers uniform would would really go go across well. It's just absolute nonsense, basically. And it wasn't just her that actually said that. Um, Bill Mayer, who uh, years ago actually he made a really interesting documentary about religion. I thought he was quite an interesting guy. About religious, yeah, yeah. But he he actually said woke revolution and Chairman Mao's revolution are like the same thing, and that is just the most like. He knows what he's doing there. There's such a crazy comparison yeah, to do that. The, the joke was I put what's the difference between those two things into chat GPT and it said, how long have you got? <laughs> ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Oh, dear. But anyway, so then Edward... Now, this is where the, the documentary starts to get a, a little bit sinister. Really sinister anyway. But, like, Ed, G. Edward Griffin comes back and starts telling us all about how democracy is deadly and that we shouldn't have democracy because Aristotle disliked democracy. Like, like, hmm. It, is, it, it seems a bit selective there about... Because knowing what I know about ancient Greeks and such like that, there's probably certain aspects of Aristotle's personality and ideology that he doesn't agree with. But he's decided to pick um, this uh, this idea about basically how he disliked democracy. And he's, he's, he's not quite sort of represented it accurately because essentially... A, it's a very, very different time, right? Okay, I don't think we, we need to, like, express that. Like, I mean, it's party time. Oh, we're in togas. Like, um, Aristotle essentially wanted oligarchs to rule, uh, but he wanted them to recall, rule democratically and fairly, but he thought that the current system of democracy, as it was um, in, um, in those times, could be manipulated because basically people were, and here's the ironic thing, easily tricked by populists. So it's the stuff that actually G. Edward Griffin would be promoting that is the stuff that Aristotle felt that was bad, uh, was the bad aspect of democracy. So again, like the metaphors and ideas are all over the place in this, this thing. He then says that basically what he wants is a constitutional republic. Now, a constitutional republic is very, very small uh, government. But here's the problem. It's, it's run by, what he says is like, we, we get a set of rules that we all agree on and that's it and we just get on with it. And the problem with the Constitutional Republic is that it's run by oligarchs by definition. And obviously once you're in power, that tends to become a dictatorship. So who tends to, who sets the rules? And are the rules like beneficial for everyone in society or just for the people that set the rules who we must remember in this system have all the power and all the money? Um, it favours the wealthy. It's very bad for the common man. It tends to fall into plutocracies and cronyism because essentially once you've got that sort of money, it's very much like modern day Russia, essentially. Um, it favours the unscrupulous because there's a lack of government oversight and regulation. Um, it doesn't have social safety nets at all. Uh, and it tends to have sort of less... Um, it would favour things like insurance-based healthcare and no welfare and stuff like that. Uh, but, uh, and so actually... It's really not actually a good system. And it's ironic that just like 10 minutes ago, they were pandering to this fetishization of the working man who would be served appallingly by such a system. Like this system only serves rich white men, essentially. Um, and uh, then what he does is he misrepresents socialism as wanting total government involvement. And it doesn't. Communism wants total government involvement or total government oversight and control. Socialism doesn't. Socialism wants systems that prevent people from slipping into poverty. Um, and he starts to go on about how individualism is the best thing for society um, versus collectivism. Or, uh, as I put it, selfishness versus community. <laughs> but he says it's not selfish to, to be an individualist. But it is by very definition. I mean, that's that. <laughs> by not you know, caring about anyone else, that's to, yeah, it's, it's not selfish. Be... Like that's how we all strive because it forces you to, like, you know, it forces you to uh, to uh, to to get on in the world. It totally misses the concept of look and social status and hierarchy and the fact that if we were in a system, all of those those things would be greatly exacerbated, making the the, the ladder even further staggered. Like, um, uh, 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 yes, yeah, so, again. But they don't like the term selfish. They prefer to <laughs> describe themselves as enlightened self-interest. Yeah, yeah, but again. selfish. But what they're doing as well, again, this is a subtle nod to, like, COVID deniers and people that made everything yeah. a, a whole lot worse. You're not selfish pricks. You're individuals. And, and it should be all about individualism. And this is the problem. That's sort of almost like the perfect exam example of why. You know what? No. Individualism fucks stuff up when there's a crisis that affects more than just you, right? And you're being mildly inconvenienced or put out doesn't supersede the health of everybody else. Um, and 
what's embarrassing about this is that children understand this. Children inherently understand these types of things. Um, but what they've done is they've basically gone, yeah, fuck everybody else, because they're terrified of having stuff taken away from them. It's, yeah, terrible. And again, it's like uh, when they talk about the individual um, versus collectivism, it kind of made this distinction where it says the individual, first they look after themselves, then they look after their family, and then anyone outside that may be in need. Um, do I get that right, Brent? Well, let me jump in again, because this is the this is the thing yeah, that was pissing on, me on. off when he was talking as well, because what he actually said was, first, he looks after himself. <laughs> then he looks after his family. Mm. And, and again, what is like, what this film doesn't, understand like on a political level like is criticism it is criticized liberalism and democracy and capitalism consumerism but the irony here is there's absolutely swallowed everything about neoliberal capitalism which is all about the individual it's what thatcher and reagan wanted to do they wanted to get rid of the idea of class solidarity whether that was smashing like in britain smashing the miners whether it was like getting rid of like um standing at like uh, football stadiums every element of like class solidarity and life council houses and stuff like that it wanted to destroy any sense of like um a, a body of people a collective uh, and we are like you know if if you read anything about kind of evolution or evolutionary psychology we we kind of again we are actually caring at people about each other um we aren't like it's quite a really cold outlook on life to think that actually we're all really selfish um because i think ultimately human beings we we as a species we develop together like the best example is like the lifeboat men is like they're people that do that for free will go out and 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 rescue people and we they always use that example of when did human civilization the first example isn't the first city the first example is a bone that was like fixed and mended because it meant that people had to stay with that person and look after them from external dangers so it's just really mad that it goes off on this whole individualist individualism versus collective collectivism yet earlier on it was kind of actually critiquing a philosophy based on individualism and also yeah it, it, it there's so many contradictions here i got a question for you then do you think this like kind of ties in with the bullshit alpha kind of talk oh yeah of course like they think that they're all like lone wolves or something yeah, they're all twats. They're all basically they've got this they've got this hero fantasy in their own head. Like and basically like they see themselves as the main character and the superhero. It's, they're all going through their own Joseph Campbell experience, basically. And in order to do that, mm -hmm. you've got to have enemies and stuff. So so this is why they're propping this stuff up. And the irony of this stupid individualism is that they they don't believe in individualism. They believe in individualism for themselves. They want to impose rules on individuals yeah. that happen to be gay or black or foreign or trans or poor. They're, they're very keen uh, on, on the collectivization of white people. Like, they're not so keen on the individual uh, rights of anybody that doesn't fall under their, their group. Like, which is, you know, again, it just shows that it, it, it doesn't, it, it's, it's, the veneer is 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 paper thin. It's bullshit. It's just basically some justification to act like a dick, and that that's really it. Like I know that sounds glib, but that's what it is basically. Like well, then they start shouting about globalism and how they're going to replace all states with a one-world government, and the way that they're going to do this is through ESG scores. Uh, ESG scores are basically like. How environment? It's a score that says like how environmentally sound um, your company is, and they we speak about this in WEF um, deep dive. They basically claim that Sri Lanka collapsed due to ESG scores, which it just isn't true. Basically, they they changed to an organic farming system far too quickly, uh, and the country was massively in debt due to 
right wing corruption and uh, they basically stopped buying pesticides because they wanted to save four hundred million dollars. It was nothing to do with ESG scores. And furthermore, no one gives a shit about ESG scores. Amazon and Tesla and these they've all got terrible ESG scores. No one gives a shit. Like the only the thing that ESG scores are there for, they're to impress other insurance firms and nobody takes them seriously anyway. They're not there to, to impress the public or to be relevant to the public. They're there to like it is it's something completely different and and it's nonsense. They then completely misrepresent the Dutch farmer protests and farm protests all over the world as being anti World Economic Forum. It's nothing to do with that. It's to do with the Dutch government wanting to limit nitrogen um uh, release. And it's not even because of um because of global warming. It's because it's poisoning wetlands um and um natural habitats for, for certain animals. Uh, in Holland, to the degree where it's going to make it uninhabitable, is is really not a loony greeny thing at all. Um, and the amount of people that are actually affected by it, to be fair, it was really badly communicated by the Dutch government, and basically made it look like farmers were going to have to foot the bill. They've now said that no, that was never the intention, and blah blah blah. But these were all hijacked by uh, right wing uh, groups. Uh, who basically just saw it as like red meat for their their sort of like followers, and then they start ranting on about land grabs because apparently Bill Gates owning farmland with which he's going to have farms is apparently co- like is apparently something to do with starving us all to death. Like what it's not, what it is 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 basically like it's a very profitable market. And he's got loads of money, so he's bought a load of farms, and he's going to continue to farm on them and make even more money. That's it. They're not buying up the farms so that basically, like, one day we wake up and it's like, there's nothing to eat, <laughs> bastard. <laughs> like, for, um, and, and they made that weird link between, like, a billionaire such as Bill Gates buying up the land. Yeah. I think someone literally said is the same as Marxism, yeah, communism, yeah, yeah. because the state owns the land. Yeah, and they, they made the same thing about... House prices increasing. It's like yeah. that's, that's peak capitalism, and you're yeah. trying to get to display that this is this is exactly what they do in communism. They put up the houses of the uh, the price of the houses. Now in communism, they give you a house. Like okay, again, I'm not advocating the system, but like at least represent it accurately. Well, can you believe that they they then rep- misrepresent Marxism again because they say that basically Marxism is, is about uh, and this is a quote. This is a real quote. Marxism is the abolition of private property. And they basically tie this in. So all the oligarchs are going to own it. And then other than the fact that that's an oligarchy, not communism, like, again, let's not get bogged down in this stupid shit. Like, um, when <laughs> they say Marxism is the abolition of private property, it doesn't mean the abolition of personal property. Like, you're, you're still allowed to have your stuff. Private property in this regard means ownership of a business you know like we were saying earlier privatization of healthcare and such like that in marx there is no privatization it's all run by the state supposedly for the benefit of everybody in in the the country because they all have a part of it and are working to to make the 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 system strive um so if again, if you have to lie about your argument, your argument isn't very strong. And this is not the first time that they've uh, lied. Just want to say a couple of words. AI, Karl Marx. I'm sure it's how he would have wanted to be remembered. Absolutely. Um, but... What's all that about? <laughs> Crazy. This, this film has like, and this is one moment, I think some of the philosophers you were talking about earlier had like the Greek philosophers. This stuff was terrible. Like It was Karl really Marx. bad, wasn't it? Like yeah. It looked like... Done as AI. It, when they showed Stalin, <laughs> he looked like a Street Fighter Two character. <laughs> like, I was like, he's gonna die in a minute. Like, but uh, uh, sadly, that didn't happen. But they did then point out that Marx was an atheist and also a lazy freeloader, which may well be true. But what they're doing there is they're basically they're tying a theme, they're weaving the theme through of welfare, lazy, communist, godless. And that's the antithesis of apparently what they are, which is, again, not strictly true, but let's not get bogged in down with that. So they then go on to say that Edward G. Griffin um, comes out with something astonishing. He says that labels such as fascist, 
Nazi, racist, extremist and anti-Semite are just communist smears to halt dissent. And that's quite telling. Because I don't get called any of those things. Like, no. do, do you guys? No. On a regular basis? I found it quite ironic they made this statement and then later on there is a, spo- a speaker from the Nation of Islam who... Yes. Um, that they they've never had anything uh, anti-Semitic uh, <laughs> associated with them before, so yeah. you know it's strange that people would say that about them. Yeah, they are going to say that that calling somebody a transphobe or calling somebody a racist is just bullying, and these are the tactics that communists use. And it's like, hang on, it's not bullying, is it? It's pointing out that you're you've probably been bullying a trans person or at least oppressing them. Like, or, you know, if someone's calling you racist, the idea, this this is what's so strange about this culture war thing, is like, they can't just come out, and say, some do, but they can't just come out and say, the majority say, yeah, I want to be racist, I am racist. They they couch it with two ways. Stop labelling me and oppressing me, that's, that's bullying. And stop stopping my free speech. What, sorry, what was it that you were wanting to say? that people were stopping you from saying? Was was it about economics or something like that? No, it wasn't that, was it? It was something about race, was it? Oh, okay. <laughs> well, but you see, this is the problem, you see, because, like, you want to say racist things, right, okay, and be racist, which is, you know, which is an argument, if you've got that free speech argument. <laughs> but you then cannot complain when someone else using their free speech says, I think that thing that you just said is racist. And this is the the bullshit that is the culture war and this whole sort of again we're victims we're being bullied your calling is racist now what they're trying to express is that the that they're unjustifiably called racist or whatever or unjustifiably called transphobes but they're not they're called racist or transphobes because they 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 tend to spend things like the bell curve or the that black people are disproportionately uh, inclined to be involved in crime or that trans people or gay people are actually just trying to groom your children. So that's why we're calling you racist or that's why we're calling you transphobic because of your racist and transphobic views. And the fact that you've resorted to the childish tactic of going, well, you're bullying me and or stopping my free speech. Well, the se- the latter is admitting that basically you you know, you've just been called out, but you want to be able to do it. And the former is just a juvenile to the point of, uh, of it's embarrassing. And it, it, and, and for fuck's sake, you're supposed to be the master race. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> Ridiculous. But anywho, so they then go on to say that Black Lives Matter is a communist plot to divide um, USA. And, and it's like, sorry, to divide the USA against two, those those commie bastards that don't want the police murdering black people with impunity, and those people that think that's all right, is that is that what it's supposed to be? Is that the plot? Like because that seems to be what they're saying, and that doesn't really that doesn't make sense. At this point, like when they brought up BLM and they brought up the founder or one of the founders of BLM. Yeah. I kind of thought to myself, like, hold on, I thought you guys, like, you know, supported freedom. Like, if someone wants to be communist, uh, aren't they allowed to be communist? No, no, they're not. Because, because, because collectivism is bad, and so we've got to protect the collective that is the United States by denying <laughs> the individual the... Oh, my... My brain's gone. Uh, yeah, it's almost as if it's shit. It's almost as if it's just mental gymnastics that that is there to legitimise people being wealthy, selfish, racist, bigot, reactionaries that are terrified by anything in the world and want to make everyone else terrified by it by misrepresenting the facts. Yeah, but you know, trying to legitimise their hate and their fear, essentially. Yeah. Well, again, and, and, and this is exactly what they do, because they, they go on to say, basically, that the, the race war, which isn't a thing, will become class war, which it won't. Um, 
and and again, it's just it it just that's just nonsense. Again, all they're doing there is nobody quite understands what that means, right? Okay, and they don't want that because if they do, there was actually a class war. G. Edward Griffin would be killed alongside um, uh, Klaus Schwab. If there was this violent revolution, <laughs> yeah, that we're coming for both of you, I'm afraid. Like uh, and tough. Um, it, it, it just it, it doesn't make any sense at all. Like, um, but what they're trying to do is they're trying to tie in the minds of the viewer or the listener or whatever that race anything to, to do with pushing race is to do with class war. Class war is a communist thing. I've heard that trope before. Therefore. It's good to be racist, which is really what the yeah that is the dog whistle. Uh, again, it's the way this film positions itself is interesting because yeah, it it's kind of uses this idea about racism, um, you know, being manipulated and, and being the next step to to part of the kind of communist control. Um, and again, because the way this film is established, the way it's kind of. Um, angled itself how it's used immigrant voices and the way it's used is multi-ethnic kind of faces and not kind of explored immigration again it does like it uses um a, a black man and woman to critique blm so it's very it's made some very choice decisions this film has it knows exactly who it's dog whistling to and weirdly, there's probably like Nazis and white supremacists who like their critique of Plandemic 3 is it's just a bit too liberal. Too many black people. Yeah, it's too liberal. Yeah. It's yeah, too yeah, nice. Yeah. It's like, there's good info, but they just don't, you know, it's too too welcoming. No, they've insulated themselves or they've, they've certainly they've tried to insulate themselves from, from sort of the, the criticism that should be sort of obvious to most people watching it. Like, But um, they then um, talk about... Woke as weaponizing compassion to make you hate people, which is, is is nonsense because being woke, as they speak about, is just common decency essentially, and they they misunderstand the point that basically the wokeism is a response to oppression. Like even in the most in 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 the original understanding of awake woke, woke to the oppression that is um, placed on certain individuals in society, usually by the government or government systems, which they apparently don't like. They don't like big government, like which is, again, the, the massive contradictions in this whole nonsense. And it's really weird that the film's called The Great Awakening. Yeah. Yeah. Awakening means being woke. You, you awaken and you're woke. So they make the distinction awake, not woke, because basically what happened was woke was originally woke. The problem is, um, very succinctly, the problem, the problem is that woke has got associations with, uh, with anti-racism. And a lot of people really, really like to be racist. And so they don't want to be considered woke. And, and that is why they don't like it and why they're trying to position it as some sort of Marxist communist plot or whatever, like cultural Marxism and stuff like that. Because essentially it's calling them out for being racist. It's as simple as that. Can I just also add at this point in the film, this is when Zuby appears as an, as an expert He's listed as an author stroke podcast. Fucking hell. I think there was, um, who was it? The, the Quack Brothers, who are entrepreneurs stroke podcasters. I mean, look, if you, if you want an intellectual documentary exploring totalitarianism, the state, authority, you got to really start questioning the level of that documentary when some of the it's experts on it are... are, are a zuby like you know no criticism of him bursting but when it's podcasters and it's like yeah it's question hey what are you trying to say man yeah i'm sorry yeah. <laughs> forgive me guys no but you you, you get experts on it. <laughs> this this film doesn't you know there's no real because it's anti-experts it's anti-intellectual it's anti-science it's that thing again of of, of being like for for the working class yeah. for the yeah for the common man or whatever and just the other thing I forgot was just what was really interesting was much earlier on was how they used Robert Malone. Yeah. The first time Robert Malone appeared in this documentary wasn't actually didn't mention vaccines. It was about the the freezing of the bank accounts of the um, Canadian trucking um, convoys. So it's just weird. It kind of places him almost as an expert talking about politics. Yeah. 
Uh, so, so this film again is very manipulative Absolutely. about the people it interviews, the the platform it gives, uh, and how it it sets them up as being some kind of authority on subjects. Fun fact about Robert Malone: he invented this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> then he goes on to completely misrepresent critical race theory as being designed to teach people to hate white people which it really really isn't like critical race theory is it's not even a big deal it's 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 basically and it, it's it's so um oh, what's the the word sociology in its most basic form it's literally like lower sixth level stuff it's like, hey, have you noticed that certain people have certain prejudices unfairly leveled against them as society? It doesn't. It doesn't mean that that basically, like you know, you didn't have it hard. It's just saying, have you understood the perspective of other people and considered the things that that the that they would have to deal with in the same way that you have got unique things that you will have to deal with that they won't understand. They have got their own lives to live, and they kind of show this. Um, uh, because there's some black guy comes on and basically says, I have two PhDs. How am I oppressed? And they think that this is a slam dunk, right? And uh, this is actually very telling because this is why a critical race theory would be very, very important and useful to this g- gentleman. Because I don't, there are certain swathes of society that do not care how many PhDs that you've got or how much money in the bank you have. To them, you are a black man first, and that is all you are. And you are worthless, regardless of your PhDs, because of their preconceived and false ideas about black people. And that is why critical race theory is vital. And it... The, it it blows my mind that, that that such a stupid point is is put across like that. But again, you know, also it's not the first time. No, a stupid it's not the point to be made also, in this film. Yeah. Let's be honest. Also, <laughs> shouldn't they hate him because he's got two PhDs and therefore he's like he's, he's intelligent. He's a he's a yeah he's too intellectual. Yeah. <laughs> it then says some politician called Mister Hawley talking about all these horrible laws designed to stop people complaining about critical race theory, and he says that basically. Uh, something like making annoying phone calls or even using the internet in a way that causes emotional distress would be considered a felony under these new critical race theory laws. So anyway, I looked these laws up. That's not true. The first one is about repeated harassing phone calls, okay, which is standard. That's absolutely what you would do. The second one uh, says... um, uh, the course of conduct that places the victim in reasonable fear of death or causes substantial emotional distress. So it's fair to say that, that he's completely misrepresented that. Just doing something on the internet wouldn't, wouldn't fall under these new laws. Doing something on the internet that caused a group of people to go round to your house and kill you would. And you know what? Call me an old lefty. But I, I actually agree <laughs> with that, to be fair. <laughs> They then start to go on about utter bullshit that like saying the words father are being phased out uh, and the and uh, the use of the word um, woman is being phased out. And this is nonsense, right? Okay, this this is an argument. This that... is why he put it in the occupations. Oh, is it? But like it's gotta be in it. Yeah. Like it's just That's why he describes people as father all the time. Oh, I see yeah, no, yes, absolutely. Yes, good point. Like, um, it's not true, right? Okay, this is a, another one of these misrepresentations of the culture wars, right? When it, there's this describe what a woman is, and what they don't tell you is that there's two descriptions of a woman. There's the legal description and there's the biological description. And those are slightly different, essentially. Like, uh, I'm not even going to bother because I'll get it wrong. Like, but the, 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 <laughs> there, is the, there is a distinction. Um, and this is to incorporate people that have transitioned. And it's just one of these ridiculous, silly, stupid, anti-trans, anti-woke arguments that just don't actually hold any weight once you actually sort of like look at them with any any degree of scrutiny. But apparently, according to the documentary, all of this stuff, all of this stuff, it's anti-family, isn't it? it, it that that's what it's about. It's uh, it's anti-family, um, and then they do the the obvious lying about kids transitioning behind their parents' back. 
because some school person and this this is again not true there are certain uh times where somebody that has got um uh, some concerns that they may be uh lgbt um uh, of of any iteration might speak to a teacher uh, because they don't feel that the atmosphere at home is um, conducive to them having this conversation. We still live in an age where people will get kicked out for being gay. I know, it's, it's crazy. But, like, you know, Small Town Boy, which was, you know, that's what the song is about. I know that's 30, 40 years old now, but it still happens today. Um, uh, and so there are circumstances where, basically, like, uh, a teacher would be solace for these people. And in those circumstances they aren't obliged to tell the parents particularly in in uh, times where that could cause problems for the child like um th- their family would murder them like or something like that because they're violently opposed to the, to 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 gay people uh, or they would uh, send them away to 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 pray the gay away something like that okay and that's perfectly legitimate but well, what they're trying to frame this is at is that basically you can have a whim on a tuesday and by Thursday, you get in prepped and pre-ops so that you can go and transition. And you turn up Friday uh, Friday uh, as a completely different person and your parents won't have a say. And this is bullshit on a number of levels because basically the hoops that you have to go through to actually transition um, is, is surprising. They're, they're, it's not nearly as straightforward as people make it out to be. And, and, and again, this is just... Just all nonsense, just bigoted rubbish. That that just it's just it's beneath people, really. It's, it's embarrassing that that we're like grown ups act like this, but this is how they do. They then, can you believe, misrepresent Marx again? They talk about they say that Marx wanted to abolish the the family, um, and again. This doesn't mean getting rid of families. It doesn't mean not having a mum and dad and brothers and sisters. What Marx was talking about was uh, making society more caring and communal so that the family isn't the only refuge that you have from society. So what this would be like is like um, if you live on an estate or in a village and if your mum's not home, you can go round to Auntie Pauline's, who's not really your auntie, she's just your next-door neighbour. But and if Auntie Pauline's not in, you can go and see um, uh, 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 Uncle Howard at the at the other end because basically everybody knows each other and you're like a massive extended family. So that was what Marx was talking about. Which nine times out of ten, MAGA lot and far right people actually won. That's the sort of the irony is, I suppose, <laughs> yeah. is horseshoe theory in, in, in to a degree. But when it's when it's framed like this, they will rally against it. Rally against it, like Nuremberg. <laughs> anyway, I also find this really funny, right? Because um, this seems to be, you know, Christians pushing this thing, and they must have never read Acts, because that's exactly what the first followers of Christ were doing. They were a commune. You know what I mean? But like, hey. Read the book of Acts. This is what's so strange about this particular iteration of of, of um, uh, Christian based uh, ideology, because it's anti Christian to my take, uh, with with my limited knowledge of uh, of it. Like it just it must be so frustrating. But hey ho. So they then go on to say that basically BLM want to disrupt the nuclear family, um, and uh, they they then go on to say that. All totalitarian regimes destroy the family. And that's just not true. Like, you know, in fact, the Nazis massively encouraged families, white families, like, certainly, but um, but they were very keen on... They had fucking joy divisions, Lebensraum. There was whole ideological positions that led to wars based on increasing the number of Germans in in families, right? So, again, this is just a poorly researched and shit documentary essentially and there's another thing that like they're missing here like this um promotion of say different types of families or whatever is to make people feel like included and not feel like just because i haven't got a dad doesn't mean i don't come from a family yeah you know because i'm raised by a single dad doesn't mean i don't have a family 
you know, is that's or I don't have brothers. Just because I'm not from a 2.4 children house doesn't mean I'm not a valid member of society. Exactly. Like, but but this is the point, and this is what's so just disgusting about this. The, everything that they're really going on about. They then ran to uh, that masculinity, how it's all being always being attacked, apparently. Um, and then the pivot back to the, the BLM founder was a Marxist. Now, kind of. Patrice uh, Cullors and uh, Alicia Garza, basically, um, Patrice Cullors described themselves as trained Marxists. Um, but the group isn't because it supports LGBTQ, which Marxist countries usually don't. So the group isn't Marxist at all. And who cares what their position? I thought we were into individuals, but apparently not. Like when they think something different, yeah. They then, um, then they go back to saying that China is really scary, but actually we should be more scared of what's within the USA. So this is harking back to the uh, gangster Edward Griffin's idea of this communist takeover from within, like reds under the bed. It's, it literally is a hark back to 1958 and then 1960s and stuff like that, and McCarthyism and. Um, you know, and um, McCarthy's um, assistant at the time was Roy Cohn. Roy Cohn was the men men mentor to uh, Donald Trump. Roy Cohn also got an illegal supply of ACT when he contracted AIDS because he was secretly gay. Then, for no apparent reason, they start going on about how the uh, Revolutionary War and uh, the American Civil War were definitely not about slavery, and that the USA is definitely not and have never been racist. Both of which are completely not true. I mean, yeah, sure, like, the the Civil War was was not just about slavery. There were other aspects in, but it was mostly and mainly about slavery and the reduction of... The, taking away slaves from the South would have basically ruined their economy. They weren't really keen on that. That doesn't necessarily mean that people in the North actually cared about slaves, but, you know... But, again, this is a very strange position to be taking for this, this uh, documentary. It almost seems to be saying... If you were suspicious and cynical, you'd be saying, particularly with all these things, that these people are nasty, horrible, bigoted racists that are just looking to sort of justify their position in some way. And then the rest of the film is really basically them just saying things that Marxists are going to destroy, that we should be really frightened of all sorts of things. World War Three might be coming. And essentially, they, go, they, they talk about the idea that Chronic fear is a way to keep people in control and stop people critically thinking, which is ironic because that's exactly what this documentary is doing. Exactly. Uh, yeah, I was going to say, it goes into a whole moment where it does like America in crisis and yeah. it's just all in a cut and it uses like Greta Thunberg oh, God. Uh, with like this arm, like a, a quote from her and like this really ominous music. And it's just ironic that the whole film talks about the psychology of fear, yet uses all the devices to create fear itself is not self-aware. No, it then says that the COVID restrictions uh, were tyranny and incentives to vaccinate are tyrannical. So, like, you know, like if you go to you, you get your vaccination here, give you a voucher to get a free Big Mac, that's tyranny, apparently. And it's like, it's not tyranny, is it? Like, you know, tyranny is people being run over in the streets for tanks and things like that. Tyranny is like, you know, journalists getting thrown out of fucking windows for, like, writing things that are opposed to the government. It's not getting donuts for, for a vaccine. No, it's not getting donuts, is it? Like, you incredibly massive fannies. Like, if you think that's tyranny, like, you will fucking never survive when the New World Order actually arrives. That's the thing that gets me. All these fucking preppers and stuff. Oh, I want to live in a, a, a forest uh, in a hut on my own. You have to spend two weeks inside. I can't take it anymore. <laughs> I can't sit here and watch Netflix for two weeks. You think they would have been like, yeah, I've been prepared for this. I can do this. Yeah. No, <laughs> apparently not. Ridiculous. It is just so weird the way it just like uses these like, yeah, certainly like very ludicrous moments of like donuts for vaccination or fast food or even a, a brothel for like vaccination. Again, they're ludicrous. They're over the top. Are they totalitarian? Not at all. No, right? then this no. is just to get manipulating. Yeah, yeah, things that are, were, and it, it does this like this, they were ludicrous. Yeah, and it uses it for like a scary means. It did it earlier as well, right at the start of the film, where it talks about the communist plot. It uses like just a, a small demonstration. There's clearly just some students yeah, in America, yeah, yeah. and it's like, oh, shock horror. There's left wing students who go on demonstrations <laughs> like that is just, yeah. again, really like quite common. That's actually not scary. That's called 
freedom to actually, if you've got an opinion, you can go out in the streets and demonstrate. And, you know, in a liberal democracy, you could say, actually, you tolerate and allow, and that happens. Um, but yeah. But that's the crux of the film, though, at the end of the day. Yeah. That's the crux of it. Like, it is, they don't want a liberal democracy. No, they don't at all. They want this constitutional republic where rich white men make the rules and everybody sticks to it. And if you can't cope, that's your fault. Like, it's a horrible, horrible system, actually. Like, it's ridiculous. Like, the fact that they're sort of like trying to portray this as in any way good for families and stuff, it's like, no, it's appalling. <laughs> like, I, I don't understand it, really, to be quite honest. They then say that science is becoming a new religion, which means that they don't understand science or religion, um, basically, because, you know, science tends to rely on repeatable facts and religion tends to rely on faith. Like, that's sort of the sort of central tenets of both of them, and they tend to be the opposite. I was very much reminded of the, but what about the Babel fish? That's a dead giveaway, isn't it? It couldn't have evolved naturally, and so it proves you exist. QED, by your own logic, you can't exist. Oh, I didn't think of that, says God. And banished to the public <laughs> logic. Like, um, but um, anyway, so the rest of the film is basically like G. Edward Griffin saying the solution is whatever you do, do it now. Which kind of sounds like a veiled sort of like incitement to violence, but doesn't actually give you any clear instructions on what to do. But you should be doing it immediately, basically. So good for him. But Neil, please don't skip over the most monumental moment of the film, which is when we see this guy suddenly appear as an old man. Like, we saw all these clips of him, um, G. Edward Griffin, um, oh, oh, yeah. as a young man, and suddenly it's like, bang, he's alive, he's still here. And he's like, Mickey Willis was like, so how does it feel to be right about everything? Everything, and, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and it's just, oh, we're, just, we're seeing everything that I've talked about now for years, and it's like, where where is this thing <laughs> like like and what he's saying is basically it's really sad really because he's basically he's an old racist white man that's saying ah oh, there's foreigners and gay people and women in powerful positions and people of color everywhere and it, i hate it i just hate it and that's that's the message of the film and it's just it, miserable isn't it he has his own hero's journey as well because it goes yeah. into his past. Yeah. He talks about how he's, he was this insurance man. He started hanging out with all these hippies and communists and suddenly he has this moment um, of almost like enlightenment. And I think he describes himself then as a crusader. Um, you know, there is a war for our minds and the enemy is collectivism. So again, like his hero's journey is almost planted as now this is kind of the bit where we move into the third act and now it's all like, how can we all fix this? Gotta say, though, it does look good for like 94. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it looks <laughs> quite good, isn't it? Yeah. He's not been drinking fluoride water, that's why. No, there you go. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. He's, maybe he's onto something. You know? <laughs> the, the, so he's basically, like, the last 20 minutes, he's basically like tedious talking heads and, like, just various different twats being wise and spiritual. Uh, and then G. Edward Griffin says that voting is worthless and the answer is to get into grassroots roots politics, which seemed to me to be somewhat contradictory um, and also pointless. Um, and also one of those things where, like, you're 90 fucking four. How lot? Like, What? And also, that's bollocks because they've got Donald Trump as, uh, or they had Donald Trump as a president, which, you know, basically enacted a lot of the, 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 the things that the John Birch Society actually wanted to happen, basically. So I, I think this whole third act is really surreal because it's kind of sets up with a question of like, well, how do we fix this? What's the solution? And it's a complete muddle of contradictions like you know it makes a point that we are all fighting each other and we should be coming together and it's like wait a minute have you not yeah. just been criticizing you're fucking serious like, you've just like spent <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Spent an hour and 40 minutes telling how everybody's an evil bastard that is ultimately going to undermine the usa for being a secret communist and how they shouldn't be allowed to exist but what we really need right now is unity and it's like are you mad this is a quote someone says we should work together to solve these problems. And it's like, again, it's an absolute contradiction. I think the greatest one, though, in this moment for me is Robert Malone, 
where he says, don't listen to the fear porn. Fuck and it's, yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and, it's, and he's built a career on and has taken part in a 90-minute film that is quite literally fear porn. The third. The third <laughs> in, in a series, yeah. <laughs> Fear upon the third. <laughs> and then it, it, it winds to, to an end with the, one of the most ridiculous, two ridiculous things. One, G. Edward Griffin does the whole frog boiling in a pot thing, which has been a trope of, of the conspiracy world for ages that basically you, know, you put a frog in a, in a boiling water, it'll get out and go, ah. If you put it in water and slowly heat it up, it will, it will stay in there until it boils to death. And this is essentially what the concept of the New World Order is based on, this uh, inch by inch, this uh, totalitarian tiptoe, as David Icke calls it. And the problem and the main problem with this is that it's bollocks. Frogs aren't <laughs> stupid. You know, if it gets too hot, they'll, they'll get out. out. You know, like you would in a bath, yeah. right? So... The the problem is that this metaphor isn't isn't grounded in reality, which is possibly why it's perfect for a lot of conspiracy theories. But then they go on to say, this is how they finish um, the the film. They say that communism is 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 a dreadful thing. Um, it and it's happening worldwide. It isn't. Um, but essentially, the reason that there's so many immigrants coming to the United States is because uh, they're trying to escape communism. And that had me thinking, it's like, can you, be, can you imagine being an immigrant, going through all the hardships and perils and stuff like that, nearly dying, getting your family away from this terrible oppressive regime into America, only to discover that it's been taken over by a communist plot from within? You'd be fucking gutted. <laughs> you'd, you'd be absolutely just livid wouldn't you like and and that's who i feel for the most these these immigrants that are fleeing communism only to arrive in horrible communist america uh, for, for me one of the the closing line where it says this glorious land our land <laughs> that with god's help we shall preserve i was like that sounds like a dictator <laughs> Is the most scary, ominous line ever. That's what's so crackers about it, yeah. But this is the thing. It's like, yeah, they're, they're actually advocating a far more oppressive regime than most sort of, certainly than socialism, uh, possibly than most communist regimes, to be quite honest. Like, And they, they either seem completely unaware of it or, and this is potentially more frightening, they're completely aware of it. And so they've they they've uh, couched the way that they would uh, uh, let let you in on this. The other thing, like the, the, like yeah, you just reminded me. Like they're acting like the children are brainwashed in China, yeah, yeah to to like worship the state. Well, do you know what happens when you start school in in the morning in America? You all turn to the corner of the room. And you you put your hand on your heart and say the Pledge of Allegiance to the American flag. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. All right. Like, that's the same damn shit. It's the same brainwashing crap. I've got, I grew up with that my entire life, having to do that every day. You know? It's, it's the same thing. What are they talking about? It's extreme nationalism, isn't it? That's the mechanism yeah. that's sort of like... And, it's, and what's ironic is that's collectivism. Which apparently like, <laughs> they would be rallying against, and like, but they wouldn't know that because they don't go to school because they don't trust the education system. Yeah, <laughs> so, so they'd be appalled. They do what? They have to pledge the allegiance. The, oh, that's, I mean, I, I kind of like it, but it's it's actually fundamentally against everything that we stand for. <laughs> Shit, like, but, uh, no. So tell us who that woman was, then, Ben. The woman that promised she wasn't political. We promised to bring this back up, right? The lady, the very end, very tear-jerking story about, you know, probably escaping a, a terrible existence, Maoist China, right? She saw, said people in her village were, you know, eating each other. There was cannibalism and all this kind of stuff. going. So, of course, you know, yeah. that's a terrible thing to, like, 
have to live through and I could see why you would obviously want to escape. But yeah, Lily Tang Williams is who this lady was and at no point did it say who she actually was. Who is she, Brent? Is, is she non-political, like she said? She says she's not political. However, in 2016, she ran for the Libertarian Party to be a senator. <laughs> if, yeah, she ran to be a senator in the, for the wow. Libertarian Party in 2016. In 2018 or 2019, she was invited to speak at the Heritage Foundation you know, the Heritage Foundation, the think tank that, that was founded by the Koch brothers and uh, people connected to Paul Weyrich that came up with the concept of uh, cultural Marxism. That's the, it. the people that, you know, that one. Yeah, that, that, but she's not political. No, Greg. she's not political. In no way. way. She's not political. And then this year, she's she's ditched the libertarians, obviously since she's uh, got connected with the Heritage Foundation and that, and now she's running for Republican Senate. This year, but she's not political. 2024, but she's she's not political in any way, shape, or form. I'm not saying these things because I'm political. Well, one of one of her political uh, adverts, <laughs> one of her political adverts, has her in full army fatigues, holding an M16, <laughs> which is, <laughs> which you know, again, it's it implies to me that she has certain political beliefs that maybe she was concealing from the audience of the documentary. Greg, look at your WhatsApp. Oh my god! <laughs> it's, amazing. it's amazing. She stood there with a machine gun, wearing army boots and army trousers, and a rather fetching um, a polo neck. She could be mistaken for a poet, and she's. Um, so holding an M16 in front of her to superimposed onto an American flag. And it says, I was once a slave before, and I will never be one again. Thank you for standing with me, Lily Tang Williams. Insane. <laughs> oh, hi, guys. <laughs> yeah, not political. I was so annoyed. <laughs> so annoyed. All the way through this film, though, is what I was doing... The second time I was watching it last night, um, and to quote Greg, it doesn't get better the second time round. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, you don't discover more with the uh, second uh, viewing. I assure you. Each person that I didn't know, obviously, we had Robert Malone, we had Del Big Tree, we had Zuby, we had all these other people, and then there was people that I had never seen before. So I thought, okay, let's search their Twitter straight away. Let's fight, figure out who they are. Every single one had anti-vax, like, comments. Well, yeah. You know, if I'd have come to it dry, like, um, if I'd have stumbled across it, I don't think I'd have been as cross as you. But I think that sort of insulated me from it because you were, like, so furious by it. <laughs> I was like, okay, what the fuck is this going to be? <laughs> so when I watched it, I was more like... I said, put all your sharp objects in a drawer because you might, <laughs> you might be tempted to throw stuff at the telly. I mean, I did get angry, like... Initially, and I, I did get f really cross at the, the sort of, yeah, no, it did wind me up because it's just overtly racist and just like bigoted and hateful and stuff like that. But at the same time, about five minutes into it, I was furious at the anti welfare stuff. But then when Gangster Edward Griffin came on, it was like, it sort of was like, I went, oh, it's this shit. They're going to do the anti communism stuff, aren't they? And so I found it a little bit more ridiculous. Than than anger making, but I but but it's but actually at the same time the worst bits that that were sort of like yeah that it's beyond the pale, uh, but dreadful film, dreadful message, not factually factually accurate, manipulative to the point where it was obvious, which is so it fails in what it's trying to, to do. It was essentially propaganda, but it wasn't very good propaganda. What did you think, Greg? I I, I just viewed this film like I say through like the Chris Morris lens i viewed it almost as a satire i thought it was a joke um because it did it was so ludicrous and it just goes to show if something calls itself a documentary again uh, as all good critical thinking should do we should question and explore that because all film is constructed and is a manipulating interpretation and emotion and this film 
does it through and through. And the irony that he uses terms like fear porn, and that is what this film is, is all fear porn. I just want to, I just want to end this with, I'm going <laughs> to, I'm sorry, Neil, but I'm going to play your voice notes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> So me, dude, I'm watching this fucking <laughs> pandemic three. I'm two minutes and 30 seconds into it. And he's already <laughs> done the fucking, like, it's all about fucking him. I can tell they've lied in the opening statement by saying, oh, we're any political race or vaccine status. Fuck you. And then he's just done this whole, <laughs> I don't believe in welfare, the trap of welfare. I guarantee that they're going to say they should abolish the welfare thing and they force people to get up off the fucking arse and get a job, right? Uh, rather than saying maybe the welfare system should give more money and help people out more. And then he's gone straight onto fucking AZT's deadly and found she pushed AZT. Uh, oh, Jesus, wet, man. <laughs> <laughs> I fucking know. I can't. It's on the third line. I'm already getting anti commie vibes. They're going to say that welfare is communist and they've got fucking Edward G. Edward Griffith. Jesus fucking Christ. Okay, there's a really fucking stupid bit, right? Okay, they're talking about how um, education is a system of government control. And so actually, the intelligent people fall for the plots of blah, blah, blah. And uh, the uh, normal working class person who works with their hands, maybe in the fields or manual labor or something, they've got like a far greater connection to uh, the earth, which is greatly ironic because that's sort of exactly what um, communist propaganda used to say about the workers in the fields and stuff like that. You know, this is when Stalin wasn't actually starving to death, mind. But anyway, Stalin also had roundups of intellectuals and doctors for this very same reason, basically. Well, not for the same reason, for the, for the reason that they basically might see through his plot. So the opposite. So basically, this film, which is anti-communist, has said something that sounds almost exactly the same as Stalinistic communist practice. Right, the documentary is now saying that if you use fear, you can basically control people. Um, forgetting the aspect that this is the third film about how the fucking vaccine kills you. Are they real? <laughs> Brilliant. Amazing. Brilliant. Yeah, all right. So, yeah. So, he, he, he clearly, clearly rubbed me up the wrong way a little bit. Like, but, uh, yeah. It is a very, very stupid film. <laughs> <laughs>